Hello everybody, welcome to Mike's Mike. My name is Mike and welcome to season two of my Lost series. I say this a lot, but I truly believe this is the best video I've ever made. So I hope you enjoy it, especially the last 25 minutes. It's good. I mean, it's my favorite season of my favorite TV show. I had to turn it out. I just wanted to quickly say thank you all so much for 1 million subscribers. I could yap endlessly about that, but I think the best thing for me to do is to do what I do best, which is this. Plus this video is planned down to the second nudge, nudge, wink, wink. So we need to get cracking. I don't think people will fully understand why these lost videos take so long until I finish the entire series. But thank you all so much for waiting. I really do appreciate it. Also, we're jumping in at almost the exact same point that we finished season one at. So if you want a refresher of what's just happened, I would suggest watching the last three episodes in my season one recap. And remember, white lines are present, red lines are flashbacks, orange lines are squad missions. Oh, and one more thing. You're talking about the numbers. Okay, so now let's get stuck into season two, episode one or episode 26 overall. This episode is the most watched episode of the entire show with 23.47 million concurrent viewers, which is absolutely mind blowing. And let me tell you, they absolutely capitalized on this anticipated high viewership by immediately offering one of the best scenes of the entire show. We open with a man waking up to a beeping sound. We don't know this man and we've never heard this beeping sound before. He gets out of his bunk bed and enters some characters into a computer and the beeping stops. The computer seems to be an Apple III monitor with an Apple II Plus keyboard. So we're talking late 70s, early 80s. He puts some music on, make your own kind of music. He then injects himself with some kind of serum that has 4, 8, 15, 16, 23, 42 on the label. And then the roof shakes. There was an explosion. He puts on his khaki overalls. His khaki overalls grabs a gun and goes to investigate. He looks through a sort of telescope mirror system that snakes around the facility that he's in and it ends in a mirror looking up into a shaft and we see Jack and Locke looking down into the freshly blown open hatch. Oh, the gag, the gaggings, present tense. This picks up moments after the end of episode 25. So we're still day 44. Remember Jack agreed to this hatch opening bullshit to try and find somewhere to hide everyone from the others. But now seeing that under the hatch is a treacherous looking shaft, he's like, ah about this one divas. Hurley is also team get up and go after seeing the numbers on the side of the hatch door. Locke on the other hand is like this is amazing. I'm loving this. Let's go in without delay. He's coming off a sequence of events he believes led them to opening the hatch. So that's why he wants to open it. Not so much to hide everyone from the others. Kate sees quarantine in big letters under the hatch door. Looks like whoever built it was protecting whatever's inside from the outside and not the other way around. Meanwhile Shannon who is Vincent's designated caretaker has lost Vincent. So she runs off into the jungle to find him with Saeed and they get split up. Shannon hears the voices and sees Walt dripping wet doing the Arya Montgomery. And then he says some gibberish, which backwards says, don't push the button, button bad. This raises, dare I say, several questions, but we'll talk about those later. Saeed finds Shannon and suggests that she imagined seeing Walt because she's exhausted. Jack asks Hurley what he meant when he said, the numbers are bad, when they blow open the hatch. Hurley tells Jack about being in the mental institution, Leonard, the numbers, the lottery, the bad luck. And Jack doesn't believe him. <laughs> What happened to being classy? They go back to everyone at the caves and Jack tells them all about how they found this hatch and they blew it open to see if they could hide everyone in there from the others, but it's not gonna work and everyone needs to relax about the others because they're all gonna be fine because they're gonna stick together at the caves. But then Locke grabs some cables and he's like, see ya. I'm off to the hatch. In front of all these people Jack just told to stay put and not worry. That bold man does not give a fuck. Kate goes with him and her reasoning to Jack is live together, die alone. Hmm, heard that one before. Like what if Locke stacks it bad and breaks his back? Hmm, imagine Locke breaking his back. At the hatch, Kate goes down first because she's lighter, hashtag skinny. And Locke's stronger, hashtag zaddy, I guess. So he's holding the cable and she's going down. She goes down the ladder and sees the mirror at the bottom and the reflection of a door opening and closing. So she calls up to Locke to pull her up, but then there's this huge beam of light up the shaft. The rope gets pulled from Locke's hands and Kate disappears, bruh. At the caves, Jack grabs a gun and heads over to the hatch. When he gets there, neither Kate nor Locke are around, so he uses the cable to go down to investigate. I think now would be a good time to go through this episode's flashbacks. Jack's working at St. Sebastian Hospital and this woman, Sarah, has been in a head-on collision with a Mr. Adam Rutherford. Jack has to choose someone to save and he picks Sarah, which means Mr. Rutherford dies. Time of death? 8.15 a.m. Sarah says that she can't feel anything below her waist and Jack tells her that she's never gonna walk again. Does that sound like something you want? Cause you're never gonna get it. 
Well, excuse me, we've actually met Sarah before in episode 20 and she was very much walking around preparing her wedding vows. To Jack, yes. They end up married. Okay, origin story. Jack's dad, Christian, sees him crushing Sarah's hopes and he's like, damn bro, have you considered giving her a little bit of hope? So Jack 180s tells Sarah he's going to fix her and does the surgery. After this long ass surgery, old mate needs a break. He goes to a stadium to run up and down the stairs to de-stress, decompress. And there's another guy doing the exact same thing. Jack stacks it and this guy comes over and helps him and says that he was almost a doctor. They have a chat about why Jack was running and Sarah's surgery and if it works it'd have to be a miracle and this Desmond says See you in another life, yeah? Jack goes back to the hospital and Sarah can miraculously move her toes in a miraculous manner. He saved her. It's a miracle. This has got to be a wig, right? It has so much volume that it looks alive. It actually pisses me off a little bit. Back to the present. Today is a gift, which is why they call it the present. Yes. Jack gets to the bottom of the hatch shaft and finds a network of hallways. Don't understate these gankings. Okay, they crashed on this island. They open the hatch. He's gone down. There's a network of hallways. There's a mural on one of the walls with the numbers on it and 108, which is the sum of 4, 8, 15, 16, 23, 42. Right, right. What an interesting number. There's also this bizarre humming noise coming from part of the facility and when Jack goes to suss it out the Halliburton gun case key around his neck is pulled towards this area in a magnetic fashion so what's that about suddenly make your own kind of music starts blaring and a bright light turns on which makes Jack duck into this strange dome shaped room with that computer from the intro in it and a bunch of other old looking tech he sees a flashing command prompt on the screen this is what flashing means guys and he goes to press execute when out of nowhere Locke says I wouldn't do that Jack's like um where's Kate and Locke doesn't answer because Overall's guy from the intro has him at gunpoint. Overall says, Lower your gun or I'll blow his damn head off, brother. The accent needs work. Overalls comes around the corner and Jack sees that this random man who's been living in a hatch under the island is Desmond. Episode 2 picks up with the Raft Squad. Well, <laughs> I guess more accurately, the former squad of the former Raft. Remember the others have just snatched Walt and blown up said Raft. So now Sawyer, Michael and Jin are actively fighting drowning in the ocean allegations. Sawyer saves Michael, who immediately after beating the drowning allegations is like, Walt, where's Walt? Babes, save your voice. He's so gone. Like no one is more gone right now than Walt. These two are floating on raft debris in the ocean. Sawyer's got a gunshot wound in his shoulder and Jin is nowhere to be seen. Like it's bad. And Michael and Sawyer are floating around arguing when a shark starts circling them. Michael blames Sawyer for Walt getting snatched and Sawyer's like, well, no, I was trying to save him. And in fact, I got shot in the process, you clown. And speaking of said shot, Sawyer just reaches into the gunshot wound in his shoulder and pulls out the bullet curve the bullet like it's so heavy metal they're broken up raft pieces they're flotsam crazy word by the way it breaks apart further and Sawyer has to swim to another piece and nearly gets eaten by the shark in the process but Michael shoots the shark and they're oomphies again this episode's flashbacks are all about Michael fighting a legal battle with his ex Susan about retaining parental rights to Walt saying I'm gonna get my son back but he eventually agrees to let Susan take Walt with her to Rome this is a rough situation for Michael I mean timeline wise this is right after he had that car accident and he's low on funds so he's not exactly in the best position to fight a legal battle his last flashback is a teary farewell to toddler walt and he gives walt a plush polar bear hmm mm -hmm. and let's get into these parallels babe present day michael's floating on a piece of junk in the ocean saying i'm gonna get my son back at the hatch we've actually jumped back a few minutes to kate being dragged down the shaft and Locke's like well shit Guess I'm going in after her. He walks through the hallways and for the very first time we see the dharma logo oh how interesting. Whatever that means. The shark that was circling Michael and Sawyer also had a similar marking on it. <laughs> it probably means nothing. Locke finds Kate and she's all groggy. And then Desmond appears with a gun and says, Are you him? With a crazy looking man pointing a gun in his face, Locke's like, Yes? Babes, who is him? Capital H-I-M. E-E-M. Yeah. Desmond smells bullshit. So he asks Locke, What did one snowman say to the other snowman? And Locke can't answer it. So Desmond's like, mm-hmm, looks like you're not him. Kate says that they were in a plane crash 44 days ago. And when Desmond hears 44 days ago, he's like, he gets Locke to lock Kate in a room. Yes, pun, not everyone could do it. Kate realizes this room is a pantry. 
absolutely capital S stocked with food and beverageinos. It looks like Desmond's been down here a while and also everything has that weird Dharma logo on it. Now, quick detour, because back at the caves, Claire has just found a Mary statue in Charlie's bag. Remember back in episode 25, Charlie found more of the heroin statues and it looks like he's stashed them, even though he's clean at the moment. He doesn't tell Claire that there's heroin in the statues, so she just thinks it's a Mary statue. So she's like, oh, okay, someone's religious. Now back to the hat chinnings. Kate sneaks into the air vent from the pantry while Locke talks to Desmond about the crash. When Locke says four of his group left this morning on a raft, Desmond's like, pfft, raft. And he wants to know how many of Locke's group have gotten sick. And Locke's like, mm, weird question, no one. Suddenly a beeping starts. Desmond takes Locke to the computer and tells him to type in 4, 8, 15, 16, 23, 42, execute, while a sort of timer is ticking down. And when Locke presses execute, the timer resets to 108 minutes, which you might have noticed is the exact length of this video. Um, yeah, look, Divas, I can't really express how difficult that was for me to do, but I did it. Anything for the gag, am I right? Then Jack turns up and we're back to where we got to at the end of the previous episode. Lower your gun or I'll blow his damned head off, brother. At the end of the episode, Michael and Sawyer see that the car Current has brought them back to the bloody island again. They paddle to shore and Jin comes running out of the jungle with his arms tied behind his back. He's running down the beach and screaming in Korean and manages to say others just as Michael and Sawyer turn around to see this group of people coming at them with clubs. One of these people rocks the absolute shit out of Sawyer, Michael and Jin and drags them back to a camp of sorts and puts them in a dirt hole cell without saying anything. A short while later, a girl is shoved into the hole as well. Who is she? She wakes up and asks them who they are and they're like, well, hello, we were in a plane crash. And she's like, wait, me too. I was in the tail section. We crashed in the water and I made it to shore and I've been alone ever since. And then they found me and now I'm in here with you. Her name is Anna Lucia, and we've actually met her before in Exodus Part 2, Episode 24 of Season 1, where she meets Jack in an airport bar. So we know that she's telling the truth about being on the plane, but they don't know, and she doesn't know what their story is either. She asks Sawyer how he has a gun, and he's like, oh, um, there was a marshal on the plane, but she's not buying it. While the four of them are conspiring about how to leave the hole by tricking their captors, Anna Lucia pulls the gun off Sawyer, points it at Sawyer, Michael and Jin and says, Coming out! She's in cahoots with whoever put them in the hole and was doing recon and isn't buying their survivor story. Time for a ridiculous side note, but my friend Jake and I, we always quote Anna Lucia saying coming out, but we mess up the quote because Somewhere in the last 20 years, our brains decided that she says, Ayo, pull me up. We also call her Oomphala la Chumpha. Now, the Desmond situation is still very much unfolding. Kate climbs out of the air vent and finds herself in an armory. So she grabs a gun and sneaks up on Desmond, who's still got a gun to Locke's head and is talking to Jack. And she whacks him with the back of the gun, which causes Desmond to accidentally shoot his gun on his way down. Desmond sees that he's accidentally shot the computer and there's smoke coming from it. And he's like, we're all gonna die. Jack's holding Desmond down like, okay, lunatic calm down girl be calm but Desmond's trying to explain that he has to enter the numbers before the countdown gets to zero Locke reckons they should let Desmond go and Jack says don't tell me what to do very inch resting choice of words they decide to let Desmond run around and try and fix the computer and Jack demands that Desmond tell them how he got there Desmond says that three years ago he was on a solo race around the world his boat crashed into a reef and then Kelvin came this Kelvin took him to the underground facility and the first thing he does is enter the numbers press execute and stop the beeping what was all that about I see just saving the world, he says. Desmond says that he then started pressing the button too. And he and Kelvin pressed it together for a while. And then Kelvin died. So Desmond's been doing it by himself. Jack and Locke start arguing about if this is crazy and if they should believe him. Remember everyone, man of science versus man of faith. Desmond says, don't take my word for it. Watch the film. The film? So then they watch a Dharma tape called Orientation. If I was in the hatch, I couldn't do it guys. I couldn't watch the film because it's not in 1570 IMAX. The intro to the tape says the Dharma Initiative, three of six, orientation, and then station three, the swan. A man named Dr. Marvin Candle says that the Dharma Initiative was created as a communal research compound in 1970 by Gerald and Karen de Groot to study meteorology, psychology, parapsychology, zoology, and electromagnetism. He then says that the swan station was constructed as a laboratory where scientists could work to understand the unique electromagnetic fluctuations emanating from this sector of the island. But then there was an incident, and since then a protocol has been observed. Every 108 minutes, the button must be pressed. And when an alarm sounds, that means there's four minutes left. The Dharma members of this swan station will do this for 540 days, and then a replacement duo will be sent. Then the orientation tape skips when he says, do not attempt to use the computer for anything. 
What? Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, the law. The law? Jack and Locke are just looking at each other like, bro, what the fuck was that? Old mate Jack thinks it's all bullshit. He asks Desmond, did you ever think that they put you here to push a button every 100 minutes just to see if you would? An experiment? Desmond's like, well shit, every single day. And I hope for our sakes it's not real. But I mean, the tape says that this is an electromagnetic station and there seems to be a giant magnetic source, so... I shrimply cannot overstate how important the last couple of minutes of this video is for the entire show. So I try and remember it. Desmond tries to fire up the computer again, but blows the power on the facility. So he's like, oh shit. It's over. He starts running around, packing things into a bag, leaving Locke and Jack at the Swan Station. And as Desmond's packing, Jack sees this picture, which is really important, so remember it for later. Jack's like, well, I think this is all bullshit. I'm leaving. <laughs> John, you're on your own, kid. Locke has a breakdown next to the computer, like, why is this happening? What am I supposed to do? Heard that one before, babe. 47 minutes left on the timer. Let's go ahead and check in with this episode's Locke flashbacks. Now, we know this man has issues, yes. He's at an anger management support group and absolutely flips it when someone says that someone stole $30 from my purse. He's like, well, my dad stole my kidney. He meets a woman named Helen at the support group and they immediately hit it off. When I watched this, I was like, hmm, why does this lady sound familiar? You know, if you get kidney cancer, you've only got one. And then I realized she's Leia from Futurama. John and Helen hang out a bunch, but every time John spends the night at Helen's, he always goes and sits in his car outside his evil dad, Anthony Cooper's house. One time Anthony gets in John's car and says, so I conned you, get over it, get out of here, you're not wanted. He's literally evil and demonic. There's no two ways about it. Helen finds out that John's been doing these little visits and at their six month anniversary dinner she gives him a key to her house on the condition that he stops these weird little Anthony visits. He says he'll stop but he doesn't and Helen confronts him during one of his stakeouts saying that she knows he's scared to move past his father and that John needs to take a leap of faith with her. Now Senora Kate has gone to get Saeed to help fix the computer. It's worth noting that Desmond has told her where the main entrance to the swan is like not the hatch an actual door on ground level. She comes back to the swan station with Saeed and also Hurley. 24 minutes left. Hurley finds a stocked pantry and he's like, whoa, sort of like Crash Bandicoot, like, wow. Jack has caught up to Desmond in the jungle and he's like, nothing's gonna happen. This is insane. No, no, get those lights off. You've been pressing this button on faith alone. You don't even know where you're running from, you idiot. When Jack says running, Desmond realizes where he remembers Jack from. Yes, that's where I remember you from. I still have it. How was that girl you did surgery on? Jack's like, oh, I married her. Past tense. <laughs> Hashtag divorce. Desmond says, see you in another life, yeah? And continues running off. But he also tells Jack the number sequence. Five minutes left on the timer. Now, it's just so convenient that Saeed can fix literally anything. Kate reboots the power. The countdown hits four minutes and starts beeping every second. The computer's working, but Locke can't remember the code. 4, 8, 15, 16, 23... 32? Hurley, who remember said the numbers were bad, was trying to stop Locke from putting the numbers in. And when he hears Locke say 32, he's like, actually, go ahead. Two minutes, 15 left on the timer. Jack turns up and says, actually, the last number is 42, not 32. Looks like his chat with Desmond has shifted where he stands on the science versus faith scale. I mean, what are the chances that they would know each other and meet each other on this fuck ass island? That's got to mean something. Fuck ass Mr. Clean, Locke, wants Jack to press execute. One minute, 40 left. Jack won't do it saying it's not real. One minute 30. If it's not real, why are you here, Jack? Why did you come back? Jack doesn't believe in destiny, and yet he's there. One minute left on the timer. A louder alarm starts blaring. Maybe you should just do it. Locke says, please, Jack, do this with me. Jack, press me to me, please. It's a leap of faith. Okay, Helen reference, 27 seconds left. Jack finally presses execute with one second left, and the timer resets to 108 minutes. The end of the episode is Locke saying, I'll take the first shift. Now they're fucking stuck doing this shit in this fuck ass hatch without even really knowing why they're doing it. Six little words starts with I. Iconic. Now, interestingly, this was supposed to be the last episode that we see Desmond. And without spoiling season three, four, five, six, that's definitely interesting. <laughs> Episode 29 is called Everybody Hates Hugo, which I'm flagging because there's a similar title much later in season six. Anna Lucia et al. bring the boys out of the pit for questioning, and she now believes they were all on the plane together. Miss Oomphala Chumpha, she's a bit of a tough one. She's punchy and kicking Sawyer when he disobeys her, saying, you will do what I say when I say it. I wonder what has happened to make her so heavy metal. She takes our three survivors to the rest of her group, who have taken residence in what looks like another Dharma station called the Arrow. Remember, Michael, Jin, and Sawyer 
destroyer left before the hatch was opened. So this is the first time they've seen anything like this. We meet Libby, Bernard, Mr. Echo and Cindy, who was the stewardess who served Jack a drink in the pilot. The group says there used to be 23 survivors, but now there's only a few left. So what the fuck happened? We need to get into the mindset of Sawyer, Michael and Jin here. I mean, they probably think these remaining tail section survivors ate the others. Bernard asks Michael if Rose is still alive and he obviously tells him that she is, which is a cute moment. Charlie hassles Hurley for what the tea is with the hatch. Hurley doesn't tell him anything, but wants to tell someone about the hatch. So he tells Rose because she seems to be the only person who doesn't give a fuck about the hatch. He takes her to see it and she's like, what is this place for? Hello, Jack. Hey, Rose. She won't tell anyone. Honey, I don't even know what I would say. Jack has assigned Hurley pantry inventory and distribution control, so he gets Rose to help him. Now, he is not loving this job. He's worried that everyone's going to hate Hugo because he won't let them take shit from the pantry to make it last. When Rose and Hurley are chatting, Rose is talking about her husband, Bernard, in the present tense. Bernard has a sweet tooth. And when Hurley's like, oh, but I thought your husband was in the tail section, Rose is like... Yes. And say that shit with your chest. I know he's alive. I know it. I can feel it. Charlie's still mad about not being cast in the X-Men and he wants to know the hatch tea. And Locke's just yap, yap, yapping, revealing all 108 minutes. Desmond. Hurley Pantry. So Charlie goes and hassles Hurley for a jar of peanut butter for Claire. Remember from season one, Miss Claire likes nuts of the pea variety and she likes them buttered. Hurley's had enough and he's decided that he's going to blow up the food supply with dynamite because he knows firsthand what it's like to have a lot of something and a lot of people who want some of that something, they're gonna hate it. Why does Hugo get everything? Why does he get to decide? And that's what the episode's flashbacks are about. Right after Hurley wins $150 million in the lottery using the numbers, he's worried that people are gonna treat him differently and are gonna want something from him. Him. He quits his job at Mr. Clark's where his boss is Randy. Yes, Randy of Locke Box Company Evil Boss fame. Seems like after Hurley buys the box company with his lotto winnings, he employs ex-evil boss Randy. And let's celebrate a linking character between flashbacks. Hello, Locke. Hello, Hurley. Hello, Randy. Rose convinces Hurley to not blow up the food and he ends up just giving everyone everything instead of trying to ration it. He said, let's get out of this scarcity mindset. And let's get into this abundance mindset, which I actually support, would you believe? Because they've made it this far living off the island. Why not have a little cheeky snack and then get back to it? Charlie gives Claire the peanut butter and she's like, hmm, is this maybe my best day on the island so far? Question mark. And he scored massive brownie points. At the Swan Station, Saeed's been investigating that spooky source of magnetism that made Jack's key stand up. And he's discovered that all around that area of the facility is meters of concrete. And the last time he'd heard about that much concrete around a specific area, was Chernobyl. Could there perhaps have been a disaster of the nuclear variety? Oh, also in this episode, Claire is frolicking on the beach like, yes, life, yes, beach living. And then in the ocean, she sees the bottle of messages that Charlie put on the raft. And that can't be good news. And no, it's not. She gives the bottle to Sun to let her decide what to do with it because, oh, your husband was on the raft and it seems like it may have destroyed. And Sun decides to bury the bottle. Day 47, post-crash. Not Bandicoot, not the album by Charlie XCX, Oceanic 815. Sun has lost her wedding ring and she is in crisis talks. I mean, her husband went off on the fuck-ass raft and this bottle's turned up implying he's drowned and she's lost the one thing that reminds her of him. Very reminiscent of Kim Kardashian losing her diamond earring in the ocean. Sun has lost her diamond ring that reminds her of her husband that she crashed on a deserted island with. It's very similar, there's parallels. Anyway, this is going to be a recurring theme in later seasons. These two are consistent consistently fighting for their lives to stay together. Locke's advice to find anything that's lost is to stop looking for it. Right, right. In flashbacks, Sun is getting ready for a date organized through a matchmaker and Jin is getting ready for a job interview as a doorman at the Seoul Gateway Hotel. The owner insults Jin for being poor and then says, do not open the door for people like you. Now freshly employed as a door opener, Jin opens the door for Sun, who's at the hotel to meet with Jay Lee, her apparent match, whose family owns the hotel. This is obviously pre the official Sun and Jin era. At Sun and Jay's next date, he tells her that he wants to keep seeing her so their parents leave them alone, RE matchmaking. But he's actually seeing a woman in America and plans to move there in six months to be with her. Sun's just like, oh, <laughs> okay, yeah, that's fine. It's not like I had feelings for you or anything. <laughs> that would be crazy. Jin opens the door for a departing son, a setting son, if you will. And a poor man asks Jin to be let into the building so his son can use the bathroom. Jin lets them in, gets in trouble for letting the wrong kind of people in, and he quits. The tail section survivors have decided that they're going to walk across the island to the main castaway beach, but they're so on edge. They're like, don't make noise, travel in pairs. Like, what the hell happened to them? We will find out. Libby tells Michael that the reason why her group threw them in the pit 
shit is because they have trust issues and they don't go inland to look for food because that's where they come from. Michael bolts into the jungle. Sawyer and Jin know what's happened. He's gone after the others to find Walt. As we know, Sawyer is very me, myself and I oriented, but he's also fighting festering gunshot wound allegations. So when Michael disappears, he's like, eh. But Jin and Mr. Echo go after Michael and I love Mr. Echo in season two. Such an interesting character. We don't really know much about him yet, but there will be more later. He and Jin come across the rotting corpse of a man and Echo says that his name was Goodwin. And he nods when Jin says, others? More on that in two episodes. Please exercise patience. When Jin and Mr. Echo are tracking Michael, Jin questions whether a boot print is Michael's or the others. And Echo says, they don't leave tracks. Then there's a gaggy scene. Echo senses that the others are coming. So he and Jin hide in a bush. And they see a group of barefoot people walking past, making barely any noise and leaving no footprints. And the last person in this group to walk past is a child holding a teddy bear. Huh? Jin and Echo catch up with Michael, but he refuses to go back with them without Walt. Echo says, you have no idea what these people are capable of. They will not be found if they don't want to be. In my opinion, that quote is a little bit of a sleeper hit, like a Dua Lipa levitating situation. It becomes important in about 12 episodes. Kate says to Sun, babes, don't worry about the ring. Don't worry about it. Like, I'm sure it's fine. Like, Jin's fine. So Sun digs up the bottle to show Kate that shit is not fine. And while she's digging the bottle up, she finds her ring in the sand. Let's celebrate that. This happens while we get a flashback of Jin walking along a river after quitting and accidentally walking to a post-date flop Sun. So that's how they met, which I feel is very, like, 2000s hinge. Just running into people feels like 2000s hinge. You know what I mean? The tail section squad continue their trek across the island. I really want to talk about their dynamic because it's so different to our main group of survivors, but I'm going to wait until the next episode and you'll see why soon. Now Sawyer's arm wound is looking bad, okay? It's giving a Fester, it's giving rot. He can barely walk. Clinical psychologist Libby offers to have a look at it for him. Maybe I ought to talk to my shoulder. Michael, Jin, and Echo are back with the main group, but Michael and Sawyer are really not friends at the moment. Anna Lucia and Echo have an argument about the best way to cross a peninsula, and Anna Lucia says, I liked you better when you weren't talking. What does that mean? Back at the main camp, Saeed takes Shannon on a date. Now don't get it twisted, sister Shannon is very much still at rock bottom. Her stepbrother situation ship Boone died six days ago, but at least she's got something good going on with Saeed. She has a steamy night with Saeed and he leaves the tent to go get water, which is when Shannon sees dripping wet Walt again. And he's talking backwards again. And this time, apparently, according to the Lost Wiki, he says, they're coming and they're close. Shannon screams and Saeed looks around and can't see anything. So he assumes that Shannon had a dream. How's she going to dream with her eyes open, Diva? Shannon's like, do you believe me? And Saeed's like, she finds Walt's old clothes and gets Vincent to sniff them and says, find Walt. Vincent, however, runs straight to Boone's grave. <laughs> like, don't piss me off. That's so sassy and rude. <laughs> now, surprisingly, this is a Shannon flashback episode, which is also very scary and very frightening because why are we suddenly having a diva-centric episode? I hope nothing happens to her. She's a ballerina teacher and she gets a call from her stepmother saying that her father has been in an accident. They go to the hospital and the doctor says that Shannon's dad Adam Rutherford was in a head-on collision with an SUV and died. Well, yes, the same Adam Rutherford that had the head-on collision with Sarah in episode one's flashbacks, Jack's future wife. Oh, the excellence. That's how I address the plot of Lost. I refer to it as your excellency. At her dad's funeral, Shannon sees Boone and it's a stab in the heart. Like, ooh, damn, you really are dead. You did die in season one and it really sucked and I'm sad you're gone. You're also easy on the eyes. Yeah, but you're <laughs> Stop killing the hot characters. <laughs> anyway, he's really nice to Shannon and they're talking about how she's applied for this internship in New York where Boone lives. Shannon also says that her stepmother, Sabrina, Boone's mother, hates her. Shannon gets her internship, but then her checks start bouncing. She's like, oh, that's fine. Like, I'm sure my dad's money from the will will start coming in soon, right? Wrong. Sabrina says that Shannon's dad didn't have a will and they had a living trust, so everything went to Sabrina and she's decided that Shannon's not getting shit because she's lazy and spoiled. It's gonna go ahead and be an evil stepmother alert, but it also sucks because Shannon's actively trying to do something with her life and she just wants enough money to get set up in New York for her internship, but nope, Jordan Peele. Boone tries to get money off his mother for Shannon, but she sees right through it. And also Boone's taking a job at his mother's bridal company and is moving out of New York, so Shannon can't even stay at his house when she's there. Michael gets angsty when Anna Lucia keeps telling them to shut up when all they're trying to do is just help Sawyer get through the bloody jungle. And he asks her, what happened to you people? And Miss Anna Lucia says, they came the first night that we got here. They took three of us. Nothing happened for two weeks. Then they came back and took nine more. And took nine more. Oh my God, I love how she delivers that line. Nine 
more. And see, the best thing about this is that we will find out more about what happened to them. It's not a pretty little lies, I'm Arlene King, what happened, we'll never know. We will know, and soon. Charlie's starting to get a little bit too protective of Aaron, and Claire's like, ah. We ain't ever did that before. She tells Locke that Charlie's up in her grill and he could be a religion nut because he's got that Mary statue in his bag. Oh, the Mary statue. Remember, Locke knows all about the heroin Marys. Things are really starting to escalate with Charlie. Like he sees Locke hanging out with Claire and Aaron and starts to get weird about it. He and Locke have a chat and Charlie's like, well, you know, Claire was about to give the baby up for adoption. She needs to learn a thing or two about responsibility, which is when Locke says, that's a bit rich coming from a heroin addict. Oh, Michael helps Sawyer when he collapses and Sawyer's like, I left you behind. And Michael's like, well, good thing I ain't you. So let's squash that beef. Consider it squashed. Anna Lucia is super antsy, trying to keep things moving in the jungle and doesn't want them to stop. But Echo and Michael stop the group so they can make a stretcher for Sawyer. While they're all working to get Sawyer's stretcher up an embankment, Cindy disappears. Cindy, the TV is leaking. She literally just disappeared into thin air, but how can she just be gone? Then they all hear the voices and Anna Lucia screams, Rap! now the voices. I hear you asking, what are the voices? Well, this sounds implies that the voices are tied to the others because you hear the voices you get the others we do get an explanation for the voices in season six but i don't like it mm -mm, i don't like it it also doesn't really match up with what's happened here but hold that thought for season six i guess in like two years <laughs> shannon and vincent push on with operation find walt and saeed joins they're running through the jungle and it starts raining when it's raining in this show bad news Ooh, bad terrible news. Shannon tells Saeed that, you know, everyone thinks she's worthless and he'll leave her if they ever get off the island. But Saeed's so boyfriend, he's like, no, I love you. I would never leave you. I would never do that. Oh, these characters are having a good moment. It would be a shame if something happened. And then they both hear the whispers and they both see Walt doing the Arya Montgomery. As in Saeed also saw Walt, not just Shannon. Shannon chases after Walt, but gets shot by Anna Lucia. Okay, we will discuss the shootification of Shannon and her departure from the Diva Dictionary in two episodes. But right now I want to ask the question, how did Saeed also see Walt? Episode 7, or 32 overall, is called The Other 48 Days. And can you tell that there is about to be excellence? The episode starts with the tail section of Oceanic Fly 815 crashing in the water. Let me tell you, it is absolute fucking chaos. And you thought crashing on the beach was bad. There's bodies everywhere in the water, there's people screaming. We have Anna Lucia and Mr. Echo saving people, including two kids, which is an interesting new aspect because we didn't have any children in our main castaway group. Mr. Echo asks Cindy to look after the kids while he goes into the ocean and, you know, collects all the bodies. Libby's helping a guy with a broken leg and Anna Lucia saves Bernard from being stuck in a tree with the help of Goodwin. Goodwin says that he was in the Peace Corps, which is how he knows how to do things like start a fire without matches. Wow, how useful and handy. That night, night one, three of the 23 survivors go missing and Mr. Echo kills two men in ratty clothing with no shoes and no belongings who were trying to attack him. Anna Lucia is butting heads with this guy, Nathan, who disagrees with her plan to move inland for cover. Like Cindy's saying they need to keep a signal fire burning on the beach because the rescue people have no idea where to look since the pilot said they lost communication and turned around so they'd been flying for two hours in the wrong direction before crashing. The inclusion of Cindy as a tail section survivor is such a good linking piece to me. Taking someone that's easily recognizable from the pilot because every time we went into flashbacks of the plane crashing, we saw her. And then including her in this new section of survivors, Mm. After killing those two men, Echo has taken a vow of silence and he's been etching stuff into a staff that he's making. On day 12, Anna Lucia starts getting suspicious of Nathan and that night, more barefoot people come into the camp and take nine more of the survivors, including the kids. Nine more. Took nine more. And when Jin later sees the group of others walking past him and Mr. Echo in the bushes, one of the children is carrying the teddy bear that one of these kids had after the crash. Anna Lucia kills one of the assailants and in their pocket, she finds a really old US Army knife and a list of names and appearance descriptions, the nine that got kidnapped. But how do they get these names? Well, there must be a mole. Anna Lucia suspects that Nathan is a mole for these mysterious people, and on day 19, she chucks him in a pit that she's been digging. Well, yes, the same pit that Sawyer, Michael, and Jin end up in. And she's not alone in thinking this. Libby also thinks that Nathan is sus, and Cindy says that she doesn't remember him being on the plane. Goodwin, however, is like, whoa, let's calm down. And Bernard's like, we don't know for sure if he's a spy. And Mr. Echo, well, 
He's sworn to a vow of silence. Like, he ain't seen shit. On day 23, Goodwin tells Anna to let Nathan go because they're not savages. And then that night, he helps Nathan out of the hole, presumably to help him escape. But then he snaps his neck and hides his body, which means on day 24, everyone thinks that Nathan escaped. On day 27, they find the Arrow Dharma station and infiltrator Goodwin is equally shocked by this. I'm making a point of that because later on, this mysterious group of others, it's like, how much do they actually know about the island? Inside they find a Bible, a radio transmitter, and a glass eye. Whose glass eye, you're wondering? Well, we never find out. Ever. So forget about it. Goodwin's not loving that these people now have a radio. So he's like, I'm going to take it to higher ground and get a signal. And he's obviously planning to destroy it. But then Anna Lucia is like, oh, stunning babe, I'll come with you. And then she goes detective mode and gets him. Yes, she earns her diva ship. When I saw you on the beach 10 minutes after the crash, you weren't wet. Because you were never in the ocean because you were never on the plane. You're one of hashtag them. And that was very fierce of her to be cognizant at such levels. Goodwin admits to it. And Anna Lucia asks if he K-worded the kids. And he's like, oh, absolutely not. They're fine. In fact, they're better off now. Anna Lucia and Goodwin have a tussle and she kills him, which is how Jin comes across his body two episodes ago. At the end of the day, Anna Lucia was simply conducting business, the business of surviving. And as Nikki said, had to cut the grass, there were snakes in the camp. On day 41, Bernard gets a signal on the radio. And would you bloody believe it? It's Boone saying, we are the survivors of the crash of Oceanic Fly A15. To which Bernard says, we are the survivors of Oceanic Flight A15, which is what we heard in episode 19 of season one. Oh, get out now! I just got chills. Can you see them? Can you see my chills? I think the crux of the excellency here to me is the forward planning because sometimes in shows something happens and it links to something that happened previously in the show, but it feels like it retroactively fits coincidentally almost like anything could have happened and they could have matched it up. But this is different. In episode 19 of season one, Boone says his piece, someone on the other end says, we are the survivors of the crash of Oceanic Flight A15. And now we have the other perspective. They gagged me a bit. <sighs> and you know what? R.I.P. Boone. Anna Lucia grabs the radio and turns it off saying, it's them. There are no survivors. Later on, when Anna Lucia starts crying about this fucking shit show that they're in, Mr. Echo comforts her saying that it's all going to be okay. And he's talking because it's been 40 days since he started his vow of silence for killing the two guys on the beach. So then on day 45, when Jin washes up on the beach, they're obviously going to assume that he's an other. That leads us to now, day 48. Cindy's just been snatched. They all heard the voices and boom, Anna Lucia has just shot Shannon. The fact that both groups of survivors thought the other group were the others and had valid reasons to assume so it's just legendary also the tail section had it so much worse than the main group and you know what it's only going to get worse Shannon dies in Saeed's arms. He starts attacking Anna Lucia and Mr. Echo and they knock him out. Miss Anna Lucia is absolutely unraveling. She knows she fucked up and she's trying to control the situation, but she's doing a terrible job. She's pointing a gun at everyone, including Libby, telling her to tie up Saeed. Mr. Echo picks up the injured and rotting Sawyer and throws him over his shoulder to take him to the OG survivor's camp. And when Anna tells him to stop because Sawyer would leave him for dead, Echo says, I'm not doing it for him, I'm doing it for me. He's trying to repent for his little homicide moment. Anna obviously does not want to untie Saeed because she's just killed the woman he loves, so he might try and kill her. Also, remember that no one from the main group knows what happened to the Raft squad, so Saeed is the first person to see any of them. He asks Michael what happened, and Michael tells him about the tail section survivors and the others taking Walt, and Saeed's like, wait... This is crazy, Ari seeing Walt in the jungle dripping wet saying shh. Anna's plagued by guilt and her plan is to get Michael to get a bunch of supplies for her. She'll let Saeed go and then go and live in the jungle by herself. I do feel bad for her. This whole 48 days, she's had to fight so hard to keep everyone alive. Now she's accidentally killed someone and everyone's gonna hate her. If you think about it, she's literally snooky sending that email and she's like, this is gonna be so bad. In flashbacks, we see that Anna Lucia is a cop. She's been off work for a while because she got shot four times in her bulletproof vest. Her mother is her captain at the LAPD. Anna Lucia is back on the beat and she responds to a domestic disturbance call with her partner who you might recognize from The Walking Dead. Umfala Chumpa is a little bit trigger happy and pulls out her gun and her partner's like, um, 
you need to not do that. So it's clear that she's got some issues going on. The guy who shot Anna gets caught. So she says that it's not him, so that he has to be let go. And she does this so that she can kill him herself. In her last flashback, she follows him from a bar to his car, says, I was pregnant, and shoots him three times in the chest and three times in the head. Jack and Kate are playing golf when Mr. Echo walks out of the jungle with Sawyer over his shoulder. They are obviously super shocked, like, who the hell is this man? Where did he come from? What's going on? Why does he have Sawyer? But then they all go to the Swan Station and Jack starts treating Sawyer's infected wound. Echo meets Locke, and this is such a semi-mysterious bad bitch link up. Hello. Hello. Sawyer's on death's door and the only way that they can get him to take medicine is if Kate like kisses his head and whispers to him and Jack's just watching this like um didn't learn that one in medical school. <laughs> Michael pulls up to camp and finds Sun in her garden and she's so gagged like Where's Jin? They find Jack and he's like, well, let's take some guns and address the fact that Shannon's just been murdered. Echo says, Anna Lucia made a mistake. And Jack's like, Anna Lucia, hold on. Remember he met her in the airport bar in the season one finale flashbacks, seat 42F. Now after talking to Saeed and telling him that she basically already feels dead, Anna Lucia unties him and gives him her gun and says, go ahead, I deserve it. Saeed says, what good would it be to kill you if we're both already dead? There's levels to that and there's layers and there's layers within the levels. At the end of the episode, Michael is reunited with Vincent, Sun is reunited with Jin, and Rose is reunited with Bernard. She knew, okay? She always knew that they would see each other again and she never gave up hope. This is the exact opposite of that one Glee episode where they decided to break up every single couple. Echo takes Jack to see Anna Lucia and they come face to face for the first time since before the flight. I think now would be a good time to talk about the sudden and disastrous departure of Miss Diva Supreme, Shannon Rutherford. Shannon was one of my favorites in season one, mainly because the actress gives such final girl energy. And I think her death feels very abrupt and disappointing because her character could definitely have been explored further. But at the same time, I don't think her death was inconsequential. It's a big linking piece between the main section survivors and the tail section survivors, and it feels important. I mean, yeah, obviously it's sad to see her go, but what a way to go. <laughs> Fevered up Sawyer is all whispery and incoherent and he says to Dr. Jack, Where is she? I love her. Oh! While this is happening, Kate sees a black horse in the jungle. Now, this horse did actually piss me off a little bit, but I'll explain why at the end of the episode. Kate's like, what the hell? Did I imagine that? This episode is called What Kate Did, so let's get into what Kate did. Flashbacks time. She's playing with a lighter, waiting at a house, and a drunk man pulls up. It's Kate's mother, Diane's disgusting boyfriend, Wayne. She helps him into bed, and he's hitting on her, and he grabs her arm, and he says, you're beautiful. She leaves the house on her motorbike, and a few seconds later, the house blows up. She rides to the diner where her mother works, and we can see that Diane has a wrist injury from Wayne beating her. Referring to the wrist, Diane says, I made my bed. And Kate says, well, your bed's gone. And gives her an insurance policy on the house that she secretly took out in Diane's name. Kate says to her mother, just remember you were here and didn't see me. I have to go now and you won't see me for a while. She tries to get a one-way ticket to Tallahassee giving very much escape plan, but she gets arrested by this guy who we know as our court marshal from the plane. As we know, these two have beef. Now he says that Kate's mother gave her up. He cuffs her and starts driving her back when a black horse runs in front of his car and he crashes into a pole. And because of this, Kate manages to kick him out of the car and drives off. Kate Catch me or I go Houdini. When she's on the run, she visits her father, Army Sergeant Sam Austin, and she tells him she found out he's actually her stepfather and Wayne is her real father, which means she knew this when she killed him. Sam says he knew but didn't want to tell Kate because if he told her, he knew that she'd try and kill Wayne and then says, hello, I'm in the army. I got to call the authorities on you, but I'll give you an hour head start. Also in the background of this scene, there's a one second clip of Saeed being arrested on TV. At Shannon's beachfront funeral, Saeed's giving this super emotional speech about how much he loved her and I'm like this is cute this is gorgeous but you guys literally met 40 days ago and started flirting about 20 days ago so this is kind of one of the most diabolical situationships known to man. Kate's babysitting sick Delulu Sawyer and he suddenly wakes up and grabs her and says, you killed me! What in the exorcist? Locke and Jack arrive at the Swan Station and Kate's gone. Sawyer's on the floor and there's 23 seconds left on the timer. And yes, of course, Locke manages to put the code in just in time. Where's Miss Diva Supreme Kate? Well, she's gone out looking for the horse. She's fundamentally a horse girl. Jack finds her in the jungle and she's having a meltdown. He stops her from running away again as she so frequently loves to do. And she full on makes out with him and then runs off anyway. So he's kind of like, um, what the fuck is happening? Saeed finds her at Shannon's grave and Kate's like, I think I'm seeing ghosts. Well, Diva, I saw Walt in the jungle right before Shannon died. So maybe I'm going crazy too. Or maybe he's not. 
More at seven. What the fuck? What is this? Michael has discovered that there are blast doors all throughout the Swan Station. But why would this facility need blast doors? Locke shows him how the computer works and says that the keyboard only works during the last four minutes of each 108 minute cycle and only numbers can be entered. Locke shows him and Mr. Echo the half chopped up orientation tape and Echo mysteriously leaves. He comes back with the Bible that they found at the Arrow Station and gives it to Locke. The Bible is actually hollowed out out, and inside is a film reel, the missing section of the orientation tape. Gag. I love these two together. Just two weird bitches. Locke says, Puh, what are the chances? And Mr. Echo says, don't mistake coincidence for fate. Okay. So they watch the fixed tape. Dr. Candle's saying, do not attempt to use the computer to contact the outside world. This will compromise the integrity of the project and could lead to another incident. Huh? When I tell you these plot lines are cross seasonal, I mean it. Like this is super relevant to the end of season five. Kate talks to Sick Sawyer, but refers to him as Wayne possession vibes. And she tells him that she killed him because she hated that he was a part of her and that she sees him when she looks at Sawyer. Evangeline Lily is acting. Sawyer wakes up like, who the fuck is Wayne? Why am I in a bunk bed? Did we get rescued? Remember, he has no context of the Swan Station. Kate takes him outside for some air and they both see the horse. Peter, the horse is here. Sawyer. The horse is here. These jewel apparitions, ooh, don't piss me off. DP me O. At this point in the show, it feels like these apparitions of people or animals are sort of like the island manifesting as what these characters need to move on with their lives. Jack with Christian, Sawyer with the boar, Kate with the horse. And that's great, but that line of thought gets mixed up in season six. So I'm just gonna ping it now as an unanswered question. At the end of the episode, Michael's at the Swan computer and there's text on the screen saying, hello, hello. He types in hello as well, which this should not be possible since there's 51 minutes left on the time. So what's going on? And remember, don't attempt to communicate with the outside world. The computer text says, who is this? This is Michael, who is this? Dad? Boom! Also in this episode, Locke cuts off Jin's handcuff and he says, free at last, huh? Okay! Toby Kavanaugh 901 free at last. I always appreciate a storytelling device like a physical object or an aging pet to show the passing of time and link forward and back. This handcuff has been on Jin for 27 episodes or a few weeks. You could also look at it in the sense that he is a different man now to the man that he was when he was locked to the fuselage in episode six. <laughs> Episode 10 is called The 23rd Psalm and it's an Echo episode, which I was really excited about because he's such a mysterious character. Why is he so religious? Why is he so strong? What's his story? He's talking to Claire and she's like, oh, you're religious, yeah? You should talk to Charlie. I think he's religious. He carries around this Mary statue he says he found on the island. That's my Claire accent. Echo's looking real shocked. He's like, um, Rachel, show me to me, please. Give me the statue. And he smashes one of the statues to show Claire the heroine inside and says, take me to the plane. In flashbacks, we're in Nigeria. We know this because they've put that yellow tint on on all the scenes. Thank you 2000s American media for that. Young Echo is playing soccer with his younger brother Yemi when some thugs with guns turn up to take the children. They give Yemi a gun and tell him to shoot an old man in the village, but he can't do it. So Echo grabs the gun and does it. The thugs call Echo a born killer and take him with them, ripping off his cross necklace and chucking it on the floor. Then the next flashback has a time jump to Echo being in charge of said thugs. He's doing a heroin deal saying that he'll smuggle the goods out of the country via Catholic missionary plane. He goes to visit his brother Yemi, who's now the village priest. He says he needs a relief plane to get the drugs out of Nigeria, which will actually help the village because we'll get the product off the street. And Yemi can also use the money to buy polio vaccine for the village. But Yemi says no. So Echo comes back later with a plan. Make us priests and we will fly the drugs out ourselves. After an argument, Yemi signs a document saying the Mercs are now priests and Echo buys all the statues. Claire is absolutely not having a bar of Charlie right now. Not even a single slice of Charlie. Remember, he told her he was a drug addict and now she knows that he's been running around with these heroin Mary statues. Michael gets Locke to teach him how to shoot a gun, which is fun because Locke was teaching Walt how to throw knives in season one. And Michael chats on the computer to Walt again, who says that he needs to come get him now. Okay, time for a fierce situation. On the way to the plane, the yellow beach craft that Boone crashed with Locke, blah, 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 blah. Echo and Charlie get ambushed by the smoke. Remember her, Miss Smoke, that diva? Echo doesn't run because he's a bad bitch. So the smoke comes right up to his face like this, almost like it's analyzing him. This is similar to Locke staring into the monster at the start of season one. There's sort of flashes of Echo's memories in the smoke. So what the fuck's going on? You will get an answer to that, but absolutely not now. You'll get answers to that in season five. This is technically only the second time that we've seen the smoke up close like this. Remember Kate, Jack and Locke briefly saw it in episode 25 when it tried to drag Locke into a hole in the ground. But I would say that this was the first full appearance. Like, damn, it really is smoke. It's just smoke floating out of a volcano. Caroline Polachek, I just took your job. So Echo and Charlie find the Boone heroin plane. In the last flashback, fake priest Echo is loading the plane with the heroin Mary 
Harry's when Yemi turns up to tell him not to get on the plane. The military pull up, looks like Yemi snitched. Everyone starts shooting and Yemi gets shot trying to shield Echo. They put Yemi's body in the plane, but then one of Echo's thugs kicks Echo out of the plane, presumably so he can keep all the drugs and money for himself, and the plane leaves. I hate saying this because everyone on Twitter is like, you're lying, I hate you, but I was supposed to be on the plane. Now because Echo is wearing a priest disguise and Yemi's on the plane, the military think that Echo is the village priest. Present day Echo finds Yemi's body in the crashed plane. Imagine the capital G gag of finding your brother's crashed heroin plane after you crashed on the same island, hello? Oh my God, lost plot. Don't end all these other shows like that. In episode 36, Sawyer calls Locke Mr. Clean and Hurley says that Libby is hot in a I've been terrorized by the others for 40 days kind of way. Well, yes. Jack wakes up in the Swan Station to Locke being knocked unconscious in the gun room by Michael. Michael's stolen a gun and he's saying he's going after his son and no one can stop him. He's saying that he has to do it now and he has to do it alone. Do it now, lick it good. Suck this. <laughs> he locks Jack and unconscious Locke in the armory. Kate and Sawyer arrive just in time to do the button and let them out. They decide to go after Michael, but Jack is refusing to let Kate come with them. Things have been weird between them since Kate randomly kissed him and then of course Sawyer Wellness Gate. While tracking, Locke works out that Michael is heading north which is weird because that's not where the tail section squad walked from. So where's he going? Jin finds out Michael bolted and is about to go join the search when Sun says, oh, absolutely not. I was a wreck when you went on that raft. We are not getting separated again. Jack and Locke are butting heads again, likely thing for them to do. This time they're arguing about what to do when they find Michael. Locke saying, what, are you gonna force him to come back? Who are we to tell anyone what they can or can't do? In flashbacks, an Italian woman comes to Jack to get him to try and do a miracle spinal surgery on her father. Jack says he'll try, even though Christian says it's impossible. Jack goes home to his wife, Sarah, yes, the lady he miraculously fixed, but things are a bit weird, it's a bit off. She says that she did a pregnancy test, but don't worry, it's negative. Jack's kind of like, now why'd you phrase it like that? The old Italian man dies during surgery. Jack talks to the man's daughter and she's distraught and in her emotional state, she kisses him. Jack goes home to Sarah and tells her that he kissed the Italian woman and says that he knows he's been absent with work, but he's going to fix their relationship. But uh-oh, Sarah says that she's leaving him. She's been seeing someone else. She was already leaving him before he the Italian lady. She says this is happening because he will always need something to fix. While searching for Michael, Locke asks Sawyer why he chose Sawyer as his name, saying that he saw the flight manifest and knows his name is James Ford. Mmm, I don't know about that. Wouldn't that have come up in season one when they found the manifest? Wouldn't they be like, hmm, who's James Ford? But it never happened, sir. But also flagging this for season three. A dirty, crusty man with a beard appears out of nowhere. So what do you have to say for yourself? Exactly. This is the same man who shot Sawyer on the raft before taking Walt. Not to imply that what's happened so far is not interesting, but this is where things get interesting. This guy knows all their names. Jack asks where Michael is and he says, Michael's not gonna find us. He also says to Jack, just sit down. No one's gonna hurt you. And that Walt's fine. He's a very special boy, whatever that means. This is not your island. This is our island. And the only reason you're living on it because we let you live on it. Right here, there's a line. You cross that line, we go from misunderstanding to something else. He then says, bring her out, Alex. And Kate is brought out and she's gagged, like she's literally gagged. And this move is to incentivize them all to turn around and go back. She'd been following Jack Sawyer and Locke after Jack said she couldn't come. Beard guy says that he's gonna shoot her unless they give up their guns and leave, so they do. He was never gonna shoot Kate, but we can't talk about that until season three. Kate was just trying to help, but now Jack's mad at her. Back at the beach, Jack goes up to Anna Lucia and says, you were a cop. How long do you think it would take to train an army? By episode 12 or 37, things are coming to a head for Charlie. We're about day 54 now. He's having a nightmare that starts with his mum getting him a piano for Christmas one year and saying, someday you're gonna get us out of here. And then it morphs into his dad telling him he needs a trade because music will get him nowhere. And then it morphs into him playing the piano on the beach on the island and Aaron is trapped in the piano. He wakes up and runs to check on Claire and Aaron, but sees that Locke has taken his spot as two IC baby duties. Side note, I wanna talk about the scar on Charlie's head that he got in episode 25 of season and one after Saeed cauterized his wound. It's been gradually healing for the last 12 episodes. Yes, indication of the passage of time. Charlie has another nightmare about Aaron drowning in the ocean and he saves him and we get this fucking weird ass scene. He's in danger. You have to save him. The baby's in you danger. Have you have to save the baby, Charlie. You have to save the baby, Charlie. Like, 
Okay. He wakes up to Hurley finding him holding Aaron in the ocean in the middle of the night. Claire understandably freaks out that her baby's been taken and slaps Charlie. In flashbacks, Charlie's brother Liam's heroin addiction is negatively impacting the band by getting them kicked out of opportunities like TV commercials because he's a mess. In that particular flashback, we see a very distant banner for Widmore Construction. I'm sure that means nothing. Charlie's trying to keep the band afloat by writing some new material. But Liam sells Charlie's piano so that he can get money to go to rehab and be a good dad. Selling his brother's piano. Just nasty work. Like he doesn't give a fuck where this will leave Charlie. Ah, been a nasty girl. Hurley has a big crush on Libby and they're chatting when he's suddenly like, do I know you from somewhere? Libby's like, um, you stepped on my foot on the plane. Yes, that's where you know me from. Yes, exactly. But it's very clear that she's lying. So what's that about? Charlie tells Echo about his dreams of Aaron being in mortal peril. And he's like, well, that's obviously a sign that we need to baptize the bear bear. So now Charlie's fixating on that. Locke follows him to his heroin Mary stash and doesn't believe him when he says that he's going to destroy them. So Locke takes them and puts them in the swan armory. Charlie lights a huge fire in the jungle near the camp to distract everyone so he can steal Aaron and forcibly baptize him in the ocean. Oh, that's not. Locke takes Aaron off him and then knocks Charlie the fuck out for being insane. Charlie's like, who are you? You're not his father, you're not his family. And Locke's like, <laughs> neither are you, Flop. The next day, when Jack is attending to Charlie's Locke-induced facial injuries, Charlie tells Jack that he really didn't use. So what the fuck was all that then? Just pure mental illness. Also in this episode, Anna Lucia asks Jack this question about Kate. You hitting that? Charlie has been banished from the main group for acting a damn fool. Locke and Jack agree to keep all the guns in the Swan Armory and they're changing the code on the door and only they know this new code. And they're instating a rule where if one of them wants to get into the armory to get a gun, they have to consult the other first. Locke suggests putting the medicine in there too because Sawyer has stolen some of the meds and is keeping them in his tent. When Jack goes to get the medicine from Sawyer's tent, Sawyer's like, mm, excuse me, they were mine to start with. Remember he was hoarding them in season one. Jack's kind of had enough of this shit. He's like, whatever bro. But there's a beef brewing at a lower heat for a long time. After the drama with the bearded other, Jack and Kate haven't really been talking, but Sawyer and Kate have been flirty wordy. Sawyer stirs on the drama by telling Kate about Jack and Anna Lucia's little army. Speaking of, no one wants to join and Anna Lucia says it's because nobody's scared enough. She's come from this terrible tumultuous 48 days to this new camp and everyone's just kind of like, yeah, speech saved living. And then conveniently, Sun is attacked while working in her garden. Someone puts a bag over her head and drags her through the jungle. Kate and Sawyer find her unconscious in the jungle with a huge gash in her forehead, which prompts Anna Lucia to say, they're back. Locke, however, is not convinced that the others are responsible after their recent chat with this bearded guy. He explicitly said, don't cross the line. They didn't cross the line, so why would they attack Sun? While looking for tracking clues, Sawyer and Kate find the hood that was put over Sun's head, and it looks different to the one that was put over Kate's head, so Sawyer says, It's all in the details. And they're wrong. He ate that. He thinks that Anna Lucia is trying to con everyone into joining this little army by faking an other's attack. Kate brings this idea to Jack, so he asks Anna Lucia where she was, and Diva is offended. In flashbacks, Sawyer is conning a woman named Cassidy the same way he conned that Diva in season one with the briefcase of cash. But Fear the Walking Dead alum Cassidy is onto him. She's like, I know you're trying to con me, and I also have no money, but I want to do a con. Can you show me how? Rachel, show me to me, please, how to con. He teaches her the cheap necklaces con where she buys these stolen expensive necklaces off him, which prompts other people to do it. Later on, she tells Sawyer that she wants to do a long con, which he explains is where you con someone into asking you to do something, thinking that it's their idea, but it's actually yours. Okay, Inception. But alas, they don't have enough money to do a long con. <gasps> What's this? Cassidy says that she lied about not having any money and she actually does have money. Well, 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 what do you know? Turns out Sawyer has been long conning Cassidy. He meets up with his conning accomplice Gordy at a diner. Sir, give me the glasses. And who's working at this diner? Well, Kate's mother, Diane, of course. Gordy asks if Sawyer is midst securing $600,000 off Cassidy. And Sawyer says he is, but he doesn't feel great about it because it turns out he genuinely likes Cassidy. But Gordy's like, okay. I don't care. Get the money or I'll kill you both. Simple. So at Cassidy's house, Sawyer tells her Gordy's outside. He needs to give him a briefcase of cash. But he takes the cash out and puts it in a duffel and gives it to Cassidy saying, take this and run. I'll stall with this empty briefcase and meet up with you later. He goes out to meet Gordy, but he's not there. He was never there. Sawyer goes back into the empty house, picks up another duffel. He's actually got the money and giving Cassidy a dummy duffel. He conned her 
while conning her. It's a double con the house down. But it's just a nasty situation and a big oopsies because he does genuinely like her. He's stuck between conning the baddie and getting murdered. Sun wakes up but can't remember anything and everyone's on edge. Kate realizes that this is all Anna Lucia's play to get the guns for her little army and she tells Sawyer to go warn Locke that Jack's coming for the guns. He does and Locke suggests that Sawyer help him move the guns. Jack realizes the guns are gone and goes to confront Locke about it but the truth comes out. Sawyer took the guns. You wouldn't bloody believe it. He did a long con. He got Charlie to fake attack Sun, conned Kate into thinking it was Anna Lucia's idea which made Kate tell Sawyer to tell Locke that Jack was coming for the guns and then conned Locke into thinking that moving the guns was his idea so that he could get Charlie to follow Locke to see where he was putting the guns. Bro, like this master plan, let's use these talents for good. Have we considered that Mr. James Ford? This all stems from Jack going through Sawyer's stuff while Sawyer was on the raft. Like it's fundamentally a pettiness issue. So now Sawyer is in charge of the guns. Kate's just like, okay, cool, so you're insane. She doesn't think that he's doing it because of the stash. She thinks he's doing it because he needs people to hate him. You run, I con. Tiger, don't change your stripes. You might be thinking, but why would Charlie agree to do any of this? It's not because he wanted his heroin Mary stash back. It's because he wanted Locke to look like an idiot. Not gonna lie, it's kind of fucked up that that's all it took for him to attack Sun. And Sawyer? Well, he says he did it because he's just not a good person. Also, remember that shortwave radio the tail section girls found? Hurley gives it to Saeed to see if he can pick up anything with its wider bandwidth, and it picks up a super clear radio frequency of an orchestra playing Moonlight Serenade? Saeed says it could be coming from anywhere, and Hurley says, or any time. <laughs> Just kidding. Things are about to get crazy. Yes, Britney Spears. This episode is pivotal, not necessarily because of what happens, but who happens. It's day 58. Danielle Russo turns up to camp, this diva. Love her crazy ass. When this lady turns up, shit's about to go sideways. Last time she turned up, she tried to snatch Claire's baby. And this time she takes Saeed to a man strung up in one of her traps in the jungle. She says, He's one of them. But the man is saying he has no idea what she's talking about, that his name is Henry Gale, and he and his wife crashed on the island about four months ago in hot air balloon. Said cuts him down and he tries to run away, so Danielle shoots an arrow through his shoulder. Said takes this Henry Gale back to Jack and Locke, and Danielle says to interrogate him. But watch out, he will lie for a very long time before telling the truth. Jack takes the crossbow bolt out of Henry's shoulder. It's pretty heavy metal. And Saeed asks Locke to change the armory lock code so that he can interrogate Henry in there. They convince Jack that the armory is a good place to let Henry rest. And then Saeed slams the door shut and gets to work. In flashbacks, 23 year old Republican guard era Saeed is burning and shredding files when US soldiers turn up and take him hostage. Um, girl, this CGI. Let's stick to practical effects. This show looks so good in general until they whip out some crusty CGI and it's like Ugh. because Saeed can speak English they want him to find out where a captured American pilot is and tell them and who's asking Saeed to do this well Kate's adopted father Sam Austin of course they want Saeed to interrogate his commander Tariq but Tariq won't say shit and he calls Saeed a disgrace for working with the Americans Saeed is taken to meet another American general and this guy voices Mr. Krabs I want to talk to you about your buddy so that's literally all I could think about Mr. Krabs says that Tariq was in charge of a chemical weapons assault on a village that that Saeed had family in. So Tariq is bad news, and Mr. Krabs wants Saeed to torture him to get the pilot's location. So he does, and he tells Mr. Krabs that the pilot was actually executed two days ago. The American soldiers pull out of the area and let Saeed go, saying, at least you have a new skill set you can use, but Saeed says he'll never do it again. So this was the start of his torturing era. Jack is fuming. He's like, Locke, you absolute demon. Why did you change the armory code? Also, just wanted to point out the crazy camera angles in this sequence showing the disjointed leadership. Okay. Saeed interrogates Henry and his story's holding up. Crashed air balloon gives the dimensions and the design of the balloon, etc. Henry's like, why should I tell you anything if you won't tell me anything? Is he fishing for information or is he just a confused prisoner on an island? Having freshly experienced Shannon departure, Saeed hones in onto the aspect of Henry's story about him burying his wife, saying if it was true, then Henry would remember every single detail. Henry's like, oh, did you lose someone here on the island? Saeed's like, yeah, mate, in an accident because someone thought that she was someone like you. Saeed thinks Henry's lying and nothing that Henry could say would change that. Jack and Locke arguing about opening the armory door and the alarm starts going off, but Jack won't let Locke go put the numbers in unless he opens the armory door. The one minute alarm starts going off pinging every second. Locke's freaking out, 27 seconds left. He opens the armory door, 10 seconds left. He runs to the computer and puts the numbers in wrong. So he has to redo it. The timer hits zero. Things start shaking. There's an ominous whirring sound. <laughs> 
and the countdown timer starts spinning, but not spinning to reset. Hieroglyphs start appearing instead of numbers, and we see four of them before Locke manages to put the numbers in and press execute. It's just too good. Now in the armory, Jack manages to pull Saeed off Henry, who looks at him like this. As I said, Saeed is convinced that Henry is one of them. He talks to Charlie and tells him about Henry and says he hasn't forgotten what the others did to Charlie and Claire. Well, what did happen to Claire when the others took her 30 episodes ago? Well, it's about time we found out. This episode scared the shit out of me the first time I watched it. It's also a Claire episode and we haven't had one of those in a while. It's night 58 post crash and baby Aaron is sick. Rousseau turns up out of nowhere saying, it's because he's infected. Claire's just like, um, you're the lady that tried to steal him from me, so please leave. And Rousseau says, you don't remember, do you? Claire then has this brief flashback. It's a vaccine, we don't want him to get sick. <laughs> Now this is T. Remember Rousseau's scratch marks from the season one finale? That dramatic ass noise at the start happens every time she has one of these flashbacks and it scared me so much the first time I watched the episode. Jack says that Aaron is fine and not infected, but Claire doesn't believe him. I mean, Jack didn't believe her last time she thought something was wrong and she was right. She gets clinical psychologist Libby to help her remember her lost memories from when Ethan snatched her and it all starts coming back. She's in a Dharma facility of sorts and Ethan is her baby doctor. Claire's laying there sedated and delusional and unaware that anything's off. He injects a vaccine into her stomach from a vial labeled CR4815162342. You're talking bit nimbus. Present day Claire realizes that she needs to find this facility that the vaccine's in for Aaron. And she links up with Queens Kate and Rousseau, leaving Aaron with Sun. When Sun tells Claire not to leave Aaron, Claire says, Sorry, are you a mother? Well, she's a mother to many if you think about it. Next flashback, Ethan shows Claire a room that's being set up for her baby. He talks to the bearded other from the raft and the jungle lion conversation, except this time he's beardless and looking very clean and normal. These others aren't presenting like how we've come to expect, dirty, unsophisticated, feral, and I'm not just describing you. They're talking about how Ethan had to fast track taking Claire because the survivors worked out that he wasn't on the plane. And the unbearded bearded other says, well, what am I supposed to tell him? Do you know what he's gonna do when he finds out? Who the fuck? Rousseau takes Claire and Kate to the spot that Claire scratched her. Claire's like, okay lady, now take me to the facility with the vaccine. I know that's where you were taking me when I scratched you. Where is it? Rousseau's just standing there like, no, you idiot. Next flashback. Ethan takes sedated Claire for a walk outside the facility. He says, I'm going to miss you. I wish you didn't have to go. Huh? We've been through this before, Claire. There's not enough vaccine for you and the baby. Claire expresses concern about leaving her baby. And Ethan says, we're good people. You have a choice. If you're going to leave your baby with us, I want you to know you can trust us. What is going on, Divas? Present Claire remembers the location of the door to this Dharma facility and they go in. This squad is kind of everything to me. This facility is run down. It's descostang. Kate finds a locker room filled with dirty costumes like the ones we've seen the others in, plus theatrical glue and a fake beard. Oh, so they're cosplaying being poor. It's kind of giving young people living in Fitzroy. <laughs> what? Who said that? Next flashback. A teenage girl wakes Claire up saying, you have to get out of here now. You're going to die. They're going to cut him out of you tonight. Claire's sedated and not making sense of anything and starts yelling that she wants Ethan. So this girl knocks her out saying, you'll thank me for this one day. President Claire finds the vaccine cabinet in the facility, but it's empty. Final flashback. Rousseau finds pregnant Claire in the jungle, presumably where the teenage girl left her. Claire's calling for Ethan, who's got a search party looking for her. And Rousseau is like, shut up, shut up. But Claire keeps yelling. So Rousseau goes to grab Claire. Claire scratches her and Rousseau knocks her out. She carried her on her back through the jungle at night to the survivor camp, which is when Locke and Boone find Claire stumbling through the jungle. Rousseau wasn't trying to take Claire back to the others. She was saving her from them. Rousseau leaves Claire and Kate saying that she also didn't find what she was looking for in the facility. Hmm. The only thing Rousseau cares about is her daughter, Alex, who would be of teenage age specifically 16 maybe? Claire says, a girl with blue eyes helped me down there and she wasn't like the others, she was good. Rousseau's last words before leaving are, I hope your baby isn't infected, but if it is, I hope you know what must be done. Bruh. Claire and Kate go back to camp, Aaron is fine, the fever's gone. Meanwhile, Henry Gale is still being held prisoner in the armory. Locke doesn't see the keeping a random man in the armory plan lasting very long. Echo finds out about this and wants a one-on-one -on -one with Henry. Why? Well, he wants Henry to know that he's sorry for killing the two people that tried to take him that first night and he asks for forgiveness. Henry's just kind of like, um, <laughs> why are you telling me? And then Echo cuts off his beard and Echo's all about rituals. So it seems like he was growing the beard until he sought forgiveness. <laughs> Henry has been busy instigating. He says to Locke, I don't know why you let the doctor make all the decisions. And Locke says, uh, well actually, 
Jack and I make the decisions together. Now this episode, episode 16 or 41 overall, is a Sun and Jin flashback episode. They've been trying for a baby for a year. You've got to save the baby, Charlie. But it's not going well, so they go to see a fertility specialist. Sun's also been meeting up with Jay, that guy that she was set up with in the matchmaking thing, and he left to be with an American woman, but now he's back. There's no funny business though, he's just teaching her English, but she doesn't want to tell Jin because she's planning to run away to America, which we know all about, hello season one, yes. The doctor tells Sun and Jin that Sun is in fertile and Jin yells at Sun suggesting that she knew about this before they got married but then the doctor later tells Sun that Jin is the one who's infertile he's Jin fertile if you will. Sun tells Jay what happened and he says that she shouldn't run away from her life to America instead she should stay but not for Jin. On the island it is day 60. Jin finds Sun working in her garden and gets mad at her because she's not supposed to be out there alone after the bag over the head incident. When she won't leave he rips up the garden so that she won't have any reason to be out there. Bruh, it's giving old gin. And don't forget, this is all happening because of bloody Charlie and Sawyer. On her way back to the beach, Sun's feeling lightheaded and she runs into Rose and Bernard who tell her to tell Jack and Jin that she's feeling unwell, but she refuses. Instead, she goes to Sawyer because he's got the medical supplies and she asks for a pregnancy test. The pregnancy test is labeled Widmore Labs. Interesting and inconsequential, sure. She does the test, it's positive, she's pregnant. But how? Jin's infertile, hashtag Jin Fertile. Sounds like rot roll raggy and she doesn't want Jack or Kate to tell Jin. While this is happening, Sawyer calls Jin daddy-o and papa-san. Go, daddy-o. Way to go, papa-san. And Jin's like, uh-huh. Okay, whatever that means. He goes and fixes Sun's garden and apologizes to her for acting the way he did, saying, I need you. To which Sun says, I'm pregnant, but then also tells him about the doctor's diagnosis that he's gin fertile. So Jin's kind of like, one plus one equals two. How is there a baby then? Sun swears she hasn't been with anyone else, so let's chalk it down to an island miracle. Jin then tells Sun that he loves her in English. I love you. It's literally so like. Locke tells Anna Lucia about Henry in the armory. Since she was a cop, he wants her to talk to him and he's doing all this behind Jack's back, by the way. So Anna Lucia talks to Henry. He tells her the usual hot air balloon story and she's like, okay, draw me a map to the balloon and all can be resolved if we find it. And if you don't draw the balloon map, things are gonna end badly for you. So he draws the map and Anna Lucia goes out with Said and Charlie to find it without telling Jack and Locke. However, over breakfast, Henry tells Jack and Locke about his little map that he drew for Anna Lucia. And he says, if I was one of them, these people you seem to think are your enemies, there'd be no balloon. I'd draw a map to a real secluded place, a good place for a trap, an ambush. And when your friends got there, a bunch of my people would be waiting for them and then they'd use them to trade for me. I guess it's a good thing I'm not one of them, huh? You guys got any milk? Episode 42. Now this is one of the numbers, so you know that something bonkers is about to go down. In fact, something happens in this episode that is one of my favourite things of the entire show. The episode's called Lockdown, and would you believe, it's a lock episode. Anna Lucia, Said, and Charlie find Henry's balloon and his wife's grave, so it looks like he was telling the truth. I could not believe it. After Henry's weird little monologue over breakfast, Jack's gone to the beach to look for Anna Lucia. So now it's just Henry and Locke in the Swan Station. Locke hears a weird static noise coming from a speaker, so he goes to investigate. And there's 47 minutes left on the countdown, so it's not that. The speaker suddenly starts counting down from 10, and when it gets to zero, these huge blast doors come down in the central hallways, sealing Locke in the main kitchen area. This is bad, 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 because Jack is not coming back anytime soon, and Locke is sealed off from the computer. Henry's in the armory freaking the fuck out, and for someone who doesn't know anything about this facility, He's really stressed out about what just happened. Locke needs Henry's help to pry open one of these blast doors, and Henry says, I'll do it if you protect me in case these other survivors turn on me. So they manage to slide a toolbox under this blast door, and Locke starts crawling through. But then the door crushes through the toolbox and through Locke's leg, like this giant steel pole thing in the door goes through Locke's leg, skewering him to the floor. Girl. This is a fucking disaster. Yes, it has a certain disastrous quality. In flashbacks, Locke is taking his Futurama Leia girlfriend from Pitch Perfect 2 on a picnic date to propose to her. But they never make it to the picnic because Helen reads in the paper obituaries that Locke's psychotic father, Anthony Cooper, has died. They go to the funeral instead of the picnic, the way this man just constantly fucks up Locke's life. Later on, Locke is doing a new home check for this woman. Is that Nadia of Saeed torture love interest fame who Saeed helped escape? Well, yes. Locke goes to his car 
And who pulls up? Fuck ass kidney stealing Anthony Cooper. He killed himself off because he stole $700,000 off some shady men and they were gonna kill him. The 700K is in a safety deposit box and he wants John to go get it and bring it to a motel. Now why the fuck would Locke agree to this? Well, Anthony says that John can have 200 of the 700K. So John goes to the bank, security box 1516, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and he gets the money. He comes home and two of those killer shady men are in his house to ask him if he's seen his father since he died. And Locke's like, no. John lies to Helen saying that he didn't lie to the scary men and then he takes the money to fuck us Anthony Cooper at the motel. When Anthony takes his 500K and leaves the motel, Helen is at the door. She followed John. She slaps Anthony and breaks things off with John for lying and John panics and proposes to her and it's a mess, it's a fucking mess and it's all that man's fault. Now freshly trapped under a blast door, Locke tells Henry all about the button, the computer, 108 minutes, the numbers, all that and asks him to climb through the air vent in the pantry to go to the computer room and press the button. The beeping starts. Henry struggles to get into the air vent. 60 seconds, 10 seconds, then silence. The countdown resets, but everything goes dark and then UV lights turn on and on the blast door, Locke sees this. Let's take a closer look at this, okay? We've got an octagon with shapes inside that point towards a central question mark with a bunch of writing all around. There's an I am here pointing to the swan, the swan station, which we know is the hatch. Now, does that mean these other shapes are other stations? We know at least two others exist and that one of them is called the arrow. What's the question mark? What's the writing? Locke sees this for about 10 seconds and then the lights come back on and the doors go up freeing him and Henry's still there he didn't run away I cannot articulate how obsessed I am with this UV blast door map are you kidding me like actually are you kidding me are you having a joke are you having a laugh where's Ashton and one of my favorite things about it is how Locke is the only person that saw it like all that setup and build up just to have one character see this map for 10 seconds now on their way back to the hatch Kate and Jack see a flashing light in the jungle it's a supply drop a huge crate of dharma food and tools and everything the timing of this in conjunction with the blast door protocol maybe the blast doors come down so that whoever's in the hatch doesn't see who drops the supplies because they're locked in at the end of the episode saeed and lucia and charlie turn up they tell henry they found his balloon and the grave so it looks like everything was true but saeed dug up the grave and didn't find henry's wife's body he found henry gale's body some questions from this excellent episode what triggered the blast door protocol? Who drew the blast door map? Who sent the supply drop? And who the fuck is this man? Time for a Hurley episode. He's been secretly hiding food in the jungle and binge eating. Remember when he was in charge of all the food and decided to give it all away? Well, yeah, he kept some. He shows Libby his stash and says, I wish I could just get rid of it all. So they get rid of it by emptying all the food in the jungle. Um, that's not, like I get why he'd want to do this for mental health reasons, but also surely there's a better way to do this than destroying food while there's 50 people stranded on an island. So Hurley and Libby get rid of all this food and then everyone's running past like, come check this out. It's the supply drop full of food. Everyone's getting feral and snatching stuff from the crate, which is reminding Hurley of being in charge of the food. And he's also spiraling because it seems like the island won't let him lose weight. And then he sees this guy in the jungle, Harry from Sex and the City. Hurley runs after him and finds a slipper in the jungle, a real tangible slipper, the same one the guy was wearing. Ruh roll. Libby's like, hey babe, who are you chasing after in the jungle? And Hurley's like, um, no one. In flashbacks, Hugo's in the Santa Rosa Mental Health Institute talking to his therapist, who's assigned him homework of listing things he likes about himself. Notice how there's a picture of an island in the therapist's office. Hurley's like, I didn't do the homework because Dave said it's a waste of time. And the therapist's like, babes, we talked about how Dave can be a very negative influence and doesn't want you to change. This Dave encourages Hugo to steal food and says, don't take your meds so we can escape. Dr. Brooks takes a Polaroid of Hurley and Dave in the rec room and we find finally find out why Hugo was in this institute and how it all links to his weight. There was an accident involving a collapsing deck and he blames himself, but Dr. Brooks says there were 23 people on the deck and it was designed to only hold eight, so it would have collapsed anyway. Hugo's like, yeah, whatever, Dave's right about you. And Dr. Brooks says, Dave doesn't exist and shows him the Polaroid. Ooh, like he gagged him a bit with that. That night, Dave tries to convince Hurley that he's real and that it's time to escape. They make it to a window, Dave jumps out, but Hurley backs out of the escape. Jack is treating Locke's crushed leg and Locke is refusing to use a wheelchair for obvious reasons. Henry Gale is being interrogated by Saeed and Anna Lucia and he's nonstop lying, left, right and center. But he finally cracks a bit when Saeed suggests that the bearded man is the other's leader and Henry's like, him? He's never. Saeed fires a warning shot at Henry and Jack and Anna Lucia are like, um, 
let's not do that. Let's be classy. John's mad that he's not involved in this because he's hashtag bedridden and he gets up on his crutches to go talk to Henry. Henry's on savage mode saying this place is a joke. I crawled through the vents, went to your computer, let the timer run down, saw the red hieroglyphics, heard the clunking and the magnetic hum, and then that's it. I never entered the numbers, I never pressed the button. John thinks he's lying. Do we believe him though? Island Dave tells Island Hurley that he's still at Santa Rosa, never left the hospital, and none of this island shit is real. The button, the numbers, the ones you got from Leonard in the rec room, and Libby, she's interested in you? It's not real. Dave says that in order for Hurley to wake up, he has to jump off a cliff. Libby turns up just in time and convinces him that she and the island are real and tells him not to jump and kisses him. Ah, oh, beautiful, great. Let's all celebrate. Let's all Barbie jip. Everyone lived happily ever after. No, there's one more flashback. While Hurley is in the Santa Rosa rec room taking a photo with Dave, the camera pans around to show that Libby was also at Santa Rosa. Day 63 and something new happens this episode, ladies. We've got a Rose and Bernard episode. Bernard is skeptical about who sent the supply drop and thinks that Rose's camp of survivors have given up getting rescued. He's suddenly motivated to get him and Rose off the island and wants to make a giant sign on the beach, but no one wants to help him. Like, hello, a Dharma plane dropped the supplies off, so that must mean planes fly over. Rose is like, mm, mm, mm. stop giving these people false hope. Disagreements are now. In flashbacks, we see how Rose and Bernard met. He helps her drive her car out of some snow. When he proposes about five months later, Rose tells him that she's dying of cancer and only has about a year left. He still wants to marry her. She says yes. He takes her to the Australian outback to see a miracle worker. Rose is not on board with this because she's made peace with what's happening, but she goes to talk to this man anyway. He tells her that there are places on earth with great energy and that they're standing on one right now in the Australian outback and that he can harness this energy. He puts his hands up to her head and then suddenly says, I'm sorry, I can't do anything for you, Rose. But not because she can't be healed, because this is not the right great energy place for her. After this, Rose decides to lie to Bernard and tell him that the man fixed her. Jack's been thinking about what Henry said that one time about forcing a trade using the balloon searchers if he was an other. Well, now that they know that Henry is an other, Jack's like, great plan. Let's trade you for Walt. But Henry says, they'll never give you Walt. Jack and Kate venture out to the do not cross line in the sand, but get caught in one of Russo's traps. <clears throat> Sorry. <sighs> I don't want to shoot you. Well, that was horny. Kate also tells Jack about the costumes and the fake beard that she saw in the Claire station. Locke's been trying to draw the map that he saw for 15 seconds on the blast door. Remember, he was the only person that saw it. He's getting frustrated and wants to know if Henry actually entered the numbers or not. And Henry's loving this chaos he created. After all this time, blindly believing that the hatch was part of his calling, Locke is starting to feel anti-hatch. He talks to Rose about his crushed leg and how Jack said it'll take four weeks to heal. And Rose says, you and I both know it's not gonna take that long. In the last flashback, we see Rose in the airport and she drops her medicine and Locke rolls past and gives it back to her. So she knew that he was in a wheelchair pre-crash and obviously knows that he can walk post-crash. Rose tells Bernard that the Australian man didn't heal her, but that doesn't mean she isn't healed. After the crash, she didn't feel sick and it's because of the island. So Rose doesn't want to leave the island because she thinks if she leaves, her sickness will come back. So Rose and Bernard agree to never leave the island. At the do not cross line, Jack's been yelling about a trade, but no one's responding. They're sitting by the fire and Kate says, I'm sorry I kissed you. And Jack says, I'm not. Oh, but then they hear someone stumbling towards them through the jungle. It's... Michael. This episode... <laughs> also, I thought I looked tired, so I put these like eye things on and they gave me a rash. I love it. In the hatch, Anna Lucia's talking to Henry in the armory and she's sort of taunting him. She's saying, it's weird that you're so quiet. All the killers I've seen love to talk. And he attacks her saying that she killed two of his people that were leaving her alone and that she's the killer. Yes, Wendy Williams. He nearly strangles her to death, but Locke saves her. Locke wants Henry to tell him why he attacked Anna Lucia and not him and why he even went to the effort of saving Locke during Blast Doorgate. Henry says it's because Locke is one of the good ones. And this is so, 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 so important important for later. Henry says that his people will probably kill him once Jack's trade flops because he failed his mission. What mission? Well, apparently when he got caught in Russo's trap, he was on his way to the Swan Station to find John. Interesting, but do we believe him? We have evidence later to support both sides of yes and no. At that moment, Jack and Kate turn up at the Swan Station with an unconscious Michael. Now this is an Anna Lucia episode. Her flashbacks pick up the day after she killed the man that shot her. She quits the force and takes a job with TSA. In an airport lounge, she meets Christian Shepherd. They get to chatting. She used to be a cop. He used to be a doctor. He says he's going to Sydney. Sydney? 
and asks if she wants to come as well in a bodyguard capacity. It's kind of random, but she's like, okay. In Sydney, Christian makes Anna Lucia drive him to a house in the middle of the night. He bangs on the door and a woman comes out screaming at him and we can hear Christian saying, she's my daughter and I have every right to see her. Hold on, I thought you had one child and that child was Jack. Anna drags him back to the car and this is all so important, but again, not yet for later. Anna Lucia doesn't like how things are going and says, let's get out of Sydney but Christian says, I can never go back. And instead he goes to a bar to drown his sorrows. And this is where he meets Sawyer in Sawyer's season one flashbacks. The way in which this flashback storyline links at least four characters, flashback Anna calls her mum and says she's coming back to LA, and boards Oceanic 815. Back on the island, Anna Lucia wants revenge on Henry. She asks Sawyer for a gun, and when he says no, she resorts to other measures. She sleeps with him to catch him off guard and steals his gun. It's kind of random, and even Sawyer's like, OMG, that was so crazy. Michael wakes up. He's all over the place, but he says, I found them. He found the others. They're all dirty, they live in tents. But that doesn't match up with the costumes that Kate silence. Michael says that there were 22 of them, word to tell Swift. He didn't see Walt, Lyra, Cindy, or any of the missing kids. He did see a Dharma door of sorts, so maybe they're in there. He wants to go back and fight them, and Jack and Locke argue about if they should do it. Remember, the man with the beard said not to cross the line, but they decide the answer is yes, let's fight. Jack, Locke, and Kate head off to ask Sawyer for guns, leaving Anna Lucia to look after Michael and press the button. It's a bit uh-oh vibes, because she's gonna be alone with Henry, who tried to kill her, and now she has a gun. Hurley starts organizing a date for Libby. Yay for them. Everyone's happy for them. Libby heads off to the hatch to get a blanket. What could go wrong? Sawyer realizes that his gun is gone and Anna Lucia took it. Locke realizes that Anna Lucia is alone with Henry, like gulp. Jack, I have to tell you something. Jack didn't know about the little attempted murderization at the hatch. And Lucia tells Michael that she can't bring herself to shoot Henry, this other that they've had locked in the armory for a week. Michael gets up like, let me do it. These people are animals, I'll do it. So Anna Lucia gives him the gun and the combination to the armory. He grabs the gun, says, I'm sorry, and shoots her in the chest killing her. At that moment, Libby comes around the corner holding a blanket. Michael panics and shoots her twice in the stomach. He opens the armory, stands in front of Henry and shoots himself in the shoulder. What in the f- Bullet hole edition Anna Lucia and dead heroin plane Yemi appear to echo in a dream, saying that he needs to help John, that the button work in the Swan Station is extremely important, and that Echo needs John to take him to the question mark. What the hell is my hair doing? What is that? Locke, Jack, Sawyer, and Kate head back to the hatch, and Michael comes stumbling out saying, he shot me, he's gone. They run in and see the bodies of Anna Lucia and Libby, and Henry's gone. Libby suddenly splutters blood everywhere, she's alive, but only just. She's still alive, but she's barely a brew though. Michael is absolutely shitting himself. She's supposed to be dead. What if she tells everyone that he shot her? To ease Libby's pain, Jack wants to give her some of the heroin, which just so happens to be in Sawyer's gun stash. So he's like, Kate, you go with Sawyer to get the heroin, and it's a masterful play. Either Sawyer takes Kate to get the heroin, thus revealing where he's hiding the guns, or Libby suffers and he's an asshole. Jack plays dirty. So where's the stash? Literally in his tent under the sand. Hiding in plain sight. Okay, genius. Hurley sees them at the beach and he's like, hey guys, have you seen Libby? Oh, that's not. John and Echo head out to look for Henry, but Echo doesn't really give a fuck about his newly dead friends and instead wants Locke to take him to this question mark. John pulls out his drawing of the blast door map, like here, whatever, take it. He's so over the island's shit. It's giving very much crisis of faith compared to his usual stance of the island wanted this to happen. In flashbacks, Echo is a priest in Sydney and has been given the task of investigating an apparent miracle. A girl drowned and came back to life. He goes to the girl's house. Her father is Richard Malkin, the clairvoyant who made all those arrangements to get Claire on flight 815. Richard says there was no miracle. My wife is making this a big thing to spite me because she knows that I'm a fraud who scams people into believing things. So no miracle? But later when Echo's at the airport, the daughter stops him to tell him that she has a message from Yemi from when she was between places and that Yemi says he'll see Echo soon. Spooky. Echo and John are walking around following John's crude drawing. Okay, Caroline Polachek. They happen upon the Nigerian plane. Let's all internally Olivia Wilde nod. Locke has a dream that prompts Echo to climb the cliff the plane fell from when Boone was in it. After climbing in the cliff, nothing's up there. So Echo looks down and sees this question mark with the crashed plane at the dot. So fucking fierce. They move the plane from the dot to reveal giant steel doors in the ground. It's a shaft, piss off. Love, 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 love. I love hidden passageways. I love tunnels. I love shafts. I love this shit. They climb down. 
This Dharma station appears to be some kind of observation room. There's two chairs, nine screens, writing materials, and tubes. TV7 shows a live feed of the Swan station with Jack walking around. There's also a computer like the one in the Swan station, but this one says print log, yes or no. And lock types, yes. A printer prints out this log with a bunch of numbers and the word accepted. There's some sort of air vacuum tube thing and Locke tests it by putting his drawing of the blast door map in it. He doesn't need it anymore anyway. Echo finds an orientation tape, so they tap in. This station is called the Pearl and it's Dharma Station 5 of 6. This man introduces himself as Dr. Mark Wickmond, which is very interesting because in the Swan orientation video, he introduced himself as Dr. Martin Candle. Dr. Wickmond says that the Pearl is a monitoring station. What are they monitoring? Team members in the Swan Station in a psychological experiment. What's the experiment? All you as an observer need to know is the subjects believe their job is of the utmost importance. So these observers have to record everything they see happen, write it in a notebook, put the notebook in a container and transport it in the vacuum thing. John is so over it. It's all a fucking experiment. But Echo's not phased by the orientation film. He's like, we're not pushing the button because a video told us to. We're pushing it because we believe we are meant to. Locke's like, meant to? I was never meant to do anything. Every single second of my pathetic little life is as useless as that bad. This is interesting because John has kind of shifted to being man of science now that Echo is the new man of faith. Echo tells John about Yemi and the outrageous sequence of events of Yemi's plane being directly above the doors to this monitoring station on Fuckass Island. Like, how can you say that this is all meaningless? Echo now fully believes that pushing the button is the most important work in the world and will keep pushing it if John stops. He also takes the log printout back to the hatch. Let's talk about how the plane has been part of the story for 30 episodes. It combines Locke's season one search for meaning on the island with Boone being a sacrifice the island demanded, rest in peace, Charlie's heroin addiction, the tail section radio, Echo's backstory, the Dharma initiative, the Swan and Pearl stations, the blast door map, and this search for the question mark marking the end of John's search for meaning on the island. Jack administers the heroin to Libby. Hurley talks to her and she wakes up with just enough energy to say, Michael and then dies. Jack and Hurley are like, wow, she must have been just so concerned about Michael. Oh my God, it's so kind. Uh, Libby is so kind. I feel like Libby's death is one of the nastiest in the show. She gets shot twice in the stomach as collateral, is in extreme pain until she dies. And when she tries to warn Hurley about Michael right before she dies, she can't. So she dies extremely stressed too. I liked Libby, but I liked Anna Lucia more. I love complex characters and I feel like her character was so multifaceted and it sucks that her arc just gets cut short like that. But I also like it when shows aren't afraid to just cull big characters or characters that have potential to get big, especially in the way that Libby and Anna Lucia went out. So unexpected with the added shock of Michael being the one that killed them. Damn, double homicide. <laughs> It's day 65, but we're going to be jumping around to get Michael's story. So 13 days ago, he locks Jack and Locke in the armory and Computer Walt tells him to get cracking with the saving. Out in the wilderness, he encounters the others and there's a one-sided shootout. One-sided because they want him alive. They tie him up and then the Jack Locke Sawyer expedition turns up where the bearded other says, bring her out, Alex. And we have hostage Kate. Alex is from the pregnancy bunker and she asks Michael if Claire's okay. And he's like, Huh? She also says that this bearded other is just sending a message. He wouldn't actually hurt Kate. 11 days ago, they take him to their village. It's giving shit, mama. Everyone looks raggedy. There's like some flop tents and a dharma door. Michael's like, ooh, damn, you guys live like this? I guess the others are doing it tough. We know something's off because we saw the costumes and the clean shaven flashbacks a la Claire, but Michael doesn't know this. Then apparent leader Miss Clue turns up. Now this diva, Miss Clue spelt K-L-U-G-H. Levels of chic previously unknown. She asks a bunch of weird Walt questions, such as, did Walt ever appear in places he wasn't supposed to be? And when Michael can't answer, she says, for someone who wants his son back so badly, you don't seem to know much about him, Michael. That delivery saved lives and ended others three days ago. Miss Clue says that one of her people have been captured, Henry, and she says if Michael gets him back, she'll free him and Walt. Michael asks for proof that she has Walt, so she brings him out. Walt was seen. Walt tries to tell Michael that these people are making him take tests and that they're not who they say they are, they're pretending. They take Walt away again, but it was enough for Michael to accept Miss Clue's offer. He has to free Henry and then bring back these four people. All four and only these four. Jack Shepard, Kate Austin, Hugo Reyes, James Ford. Michael's like, I'll do it. 
but I want a boat too. Jump to present day. Jack is talking to Kate, Sawyer, Hurley and Michael about rallying the troops and going across the island to fight the others after they've killed Anna Lucia and Libby. But Michael's like, oh no, 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 no. What if just us five go? I feel like it should be just us five, otherwise it won't work. He's being so yelly. He's like, it's my son, it's Michael. That's how it's gonna be. And Jack's like, whoa. Uh-oh, Saeed also wants to come on the find Henry Ford slash fight the others expedition. This complicates things because it would make sense that Saeed comes on the mission, but he's not on the list. So how is Michael going to make him not come? He tells Saeed that he's not coming because he's motivated by revenge instead of wanting to save Walt. And Saeed's like, Okay, diva. But as we know, Saeed is kind of the realest and smartest oomph on the island. And he tells Jack, I think Michael's being compromised. I think he freed Henry and he's leading you into a trap. Meanwhile, we finally see Charlie and Claire on our screens again. He's found a pneumatic injector and vaccine in the Dharma palette and gives it to Claire. He's done a test injection on himself and she has to do it every nine days. Okay, save your Charlie. You have to save the baby Charlie. Also, Vincent runs up to Charlie and drops a heroin Mary right in front of him. Cheeky dog. Charlie follows Vincent to where he got the statues, Sawyer's stash. He grabs all the Marys and throws them in the ocean. It's symbolic, babe. And also, Locke sees this happen. Jack runs into Echo at the Swan Station and he's like, where the hell have you been, Loka? You were supposed to find Henry. And Echo's like, ugh, yep, yeah, couldn't find him. Babes, you didn't even try. Echo has decided that pushing the button is his main mission. Sawyer tells Jack that he slept with Anna and Jack's like, okay. Why are you telling me this? Because you're about the closest thing I got to a friend, dog. Jack and Sawyer friends again. War is over. The camp has a funeral for Anna Lucia and Libby. Everyone's super sad. And then Sun looks out into the ocean and says, Boat! I love this show. This is the first part of a two-part finale titled Live Together, Die Alone. This episode duo is going to go ahead and be the best episode of the season and maybe top three for the entire show. Season finale wise, for me, it's one of the best ever. Converging storylines, reveals, character developments, lore, mysteries, gags, goops. Okay, so there's a boat. Is it rescue? Is it the others? Jack, Saeed and Sawyer swim out to the boat. Bad bitch squad. They get to the boat and climb on. There's opera music playing. Someone shoots a rifle from inside. They break down the boat hatch door thing to to reveal drunk Desmond, who says, you, this diva, just you wait. They bring Desmond ashore, but he's off his face. He's not providing anything of value. Jack's like, A, since when did you have a boat? B, why did you come back? Desmond's just like, do you think I did it on purpose? I was sailing for two and a half weeks due west, but he kept coming across land that was the island over and over again. He also asks Jack, you still pushing it? Yeah, diva. Time for flashbacks, and these are Desmond flashbacks. Let's celebrate. He's being released from prison and getting his belongings back. A picture of him and Penny. A copy of Charles Dickens' Our Mutual Friend, which he carries around with him because he's saving it to be the last thing he ever reads before he dies. He's been dishonorably discharged from the Royal Scots Regiment of Her Majesty's Armed Forces. Fresh out of prison, he's picked up by a wealthy looking man in a private car. It's very clear that these two don't like each other. This rich man gives Desmond two boxes. One of them has all the letters that Desmond wrote to a Penny Widmore while in prison and they're all unopened and undelivered. The other is a box of cash. This man is Charles Widmore and he's paying off Desmond to stay away from his daughter Penny. No contact, just disappear. Desmond's like, why would I do that? And Charles is like, well, because you're a coward, that's why. Now remember, Saeed clocked the T of Michael being compromised. What's the plan? Well, Saeed's gonna take this new boat and scout the other's camp and then rendezvous with Jack's squad with advantageous intel. Saeed asks Desmond if he can use the boat and Desmond says, off to see the hostiles, are ya? Interesting. Locke turns up at the hatch and Echo's there, obviously. These two, ah, they're just so interesting. Locke says, let the timer go past zero. Don't be a slave to the button. Echo's like, well, no. Well, yes. Don't tell me what I can't do. Oh. Not him using Locke's catchphrase against him. Echo detects computer destroying intentions from Locke and locks Locke out of the swan. Kate, Jack, Sawyer, Michael and Hurley set out. After the costume cupboard reveal in episode 15, Kate's wary. Jack can't tell his friends anything or risk Michael finding out something's up. A weird gigantic freak bird swoops them. And it sounds like it's saying Hurley. <laughs> Okay. Desmond flashback. He's in America and a woman buys him coffee because he doesn't have any US dollars. Well, if it isn't Libby. Ha ha. If only you had 42,000 more dollars, lady. They get to talking. He's doing a solo race around the world in eight months. If he wins, he'll be winning money off Charles Widmore, the guy who tried to pay him off, but he didn't take the money. But why does Desmond need 42 grand? Because he doesn't have a boat. Well, luckily, Libby has a boat. It was her husband's, but he got sick and died about a month ago. So in this twist of fate, she gives Desmond the boat, saying it's what her husband would have wanted. Desmond asks Libby what her husband's name was, David, and what the boat's name is, Elizabeth, after Libby. Hold on, 
Libby's husband's name was David. Dave. Hurley and Libby were at Santa Rosa together and his imaginary friend's name was Dave. Okay. Also, imagine if Libby didn't die and met Desmond on the island. That would be crazy. So this boat, Saeed can't drive it. Drive? Let me drive the boat. So he needs someone who can sail. That person is Jin, but he doesn't want to leave Sun. No worries, Sun's coming too. While sailing, Saeed, Jin, and Sun come across this. A statue of a giant foot with four toes. Well, I mean, it looks like it was a giant statue that's fallen apart and only the foot remains. What the fuck? The real gag for me here is not the fact that there's a random fucking four toe foot statue on this mysterious island Tarantino tease, but that this little teaser is picked up again in like 60 episodes time. Like the forward planning is crazy. Desmond tells Claire that the vaccine is a waste of time. He used it for three years. Flashback time. He's at a stadium to run around and Jack turns up to do the same as we've seen. Penny Widmore turns up out of nowhere and Desmond's gag. Like, how did she find him? With enough money and determination, you can find anyone. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Penny's like, why didn't you write to me, Des? Desmond says, I'll be back in a year when I win your dad's race. He's got to get his honor back. Locke tells Desmond about how he found the Pearl Station and that the button pushing was all for nothing because it's some fucking experiment. Drunk Desmond's looking at him like, okay, bold. If that's the case, then stop pushing it. Well, yes, I want to stop, but someone else has started. So you and I are going to see what happens when the button doesn't get pushed. They managed to pull a switcheroo on Echo by triggering the blast door sequence while they're in the computer room and he's outside, so he gets locked outside. Next flashback. Desmond's on the boat, crashing into the island in some psycho storm. Scary ass shit, I'm anti-ocean as we know. He gets knocked out by the waves and wakes up half conscious on the shore. A man in a hazmat suit drags him through the jungle to the swan station. Now, who is this guy? Well, his name is Kelvin Inman. Does he look familiar? He's Mr. Krabs from Saeed's war flashbacks in episode 14. Like you're joking. How did he end up on Fuckass Island? Kelvin says to Desmond, are you him? What did one snowman say to the other? Desmond obviously has no idea what he's talking about. He just washed up on an island with a beeping bunker after being knocked unconscious on the Elizabeth. Speaking of, Kelvin says he didn't see any boat. So Desmond watches the orientation video. Gotta push the button every 108 minutes. There's parts of the tape missing. Kelvin says Radzinski made some edits. Radzinski was his partner and we'll revisit that in the next episode. So Echo's been locked out of the computer room and he's not fucking happy about it. He's like, wait, what if I blow open the blast doors with the dynamite these people used to blow open the hatch? He's adamant that if he doesn't stop John from not pushing the button, everyone's gonna die. He gets Charlie to help look for the dynamite. Kate realizes that her Little expedition squad is being followed. She surprises these followers by shooting at them and Sawyer kills one. She wants to chase after the other one to stop them from warning the entire other camp. But Jack says, there's no point. They already know. Jack turns on Michael and forces him to tell everyone the truth. He had a list. He let Henry go. He killed Anna Lucia and Libby, but he's sorry. <laughs> Hurley wants to go back, but Jack says, no. If they don't believe that we trust Michael, they'll kill us all. This absolutely gorgeous feat of graphic design. This is serious. I don't fuck around. Everyone wants a Mike's Mike moment, but no one wants to put in the work. Echo and Charlie find the dynamite. The dynamite must be Italian. Charlie warns Locke and Desmond that Kesha, this place about to blow. Desmond's like, do your worst. The doors will hold. Flashback time. Desmond and Kelvin trigger the lockdown sequence and Kelvin starts painting on the blast door with invisible ink. Master's degree in servology with accelerated entry into the Diva Honors Program. Mr. Krabs says that Radzinski started this UV blast door map when he figured out how to fake a lockdown sequence. But what happened to Radzinski? Well, he boom boom powed with a gun in his mouth. Desmond and Kelvin are a bit at odds. Desmond wants to go outside. He hasn't been outside in two years. And Kelvin's like, mm, I think the fuck not. So what's Kelvin's story? Did somebody say, war crimes? After the army, he joined the Dharma Initiative. One day, Desmond wakes up to the under 60 seconds alarm blaring and he runs to put the numbers in. Where's Kelvin? He's drunk in a basement area of sorts, accessible via grate in the computer room. He's dangling a key near a fail safe that says caution system termination. He says, if they turn the key, everything goes poof and it all goes away. Desmond's like, oh my God, what the fuck is going on? Just be real. What's behind the magnetic wall? What was the incident? Now drunk Kelvin actually spills some Dharma secrets. Electromagnetism, there was a leak. So now the charge builds up and every time we push the button, it discharges it before it gets too big. That sounds real and not psychological experiment vibes. Now Mr. Echo has a one track mind. Detonations are now. So he blows that shit up. I just blow up the toilet at Chipotle. But the detonation doesn't impact the blast doors at all. 33 minutes left on the timer. Desmond asks John if he's doing all this to look down the barrel of a gun and work out what he really believes. And Locke's like done that, hashtag Boone gate, hashtag rip Boone. And when Boone died, I was banging on the hatch door and a light came on. I thought it was a sign, but it was just you. Hashtag crisis of faith. Said, Jin and Son arrive at the capital O other camp. It's all fake. 
fake. No one lives there. The Dharma doors are fake. They open to nothing. Expedition Squad comes across the other end of the Pearl Station canister chute. Remember, none of these people know about the Pearl Station. There are thousands of those observation notebooks. Sawyer finds the drawing that Locke sent up the tube as a test. Obviously, it makes no sense to him. I mean, the only people that know about the blast door map are Locke, Echo, Desmond, Kelvin, and Dead Radzinski. The squad hears the whispers, and they suddenly get shot with tranquilizer darts, knocking them unconscious. This is all happening in real time. 21 minutes left on the timer. Locke tells Desmond again about what he saw in the Pearl Station, and gives him the log printout with all the numbers and accepted. Flashback time. Kelvin's acting weird. Desmond decides to follow Kelvin out of the swan to a cliff where he sees his boat, or technically Libby's boat, the Elizabeth. Kelvin realizes that Desmond's been following him, and the two have a confrontation. Kelvin was about to leave the island. But what about the bloody button? Kelvin says, who knows if it's even real? Let's just leave. Desmond flips it a bit. Like, why did you lie to me about the fucking electromagnetism? You were gonna leave me. Okay, Pearl. You ruined my life, etc., etc. The two tussle a bit. Desmond pushes Kelvin a little bit too hard. He hits his head on a rock and dies. Desmond is stressing the fuck out. He rips the failsafe key off Kelvin's neck and sprints back to the Swan Station. By the time he gets there, the alarm is blaring. There's an automated voice saying, System failure. System failure. The hieroglyphs are on the countdown timer, the walls are shaking, the magnetic hum is happening. He's trying to put the numbers in the computer, but all it's saying is system failure. Metal is flying everywhere. He finishes typing the numbers and presses execute, and the countdown flips back to 108, and things seem to be back to normal. Back to now. Desmond's reading the log printout. He asks John for the exact date that Flight 815 crashed, September 22nd. On the printout for 922044 colon 16, September 22nd, 2004, it says system failure. I think I crashed your plane. That right there is pop culture history. A plot arc, 49 episodes in the making. And you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna say it. One of the best plot arcs in TV ever. Now the others have gagged and bagged Kate, Jack, Sawyer and Hurley and have dragged them onto a jetty. Sorry, but Jack with a gag looks like that one chicken from Chicken Run. No, she says she knows your beard's fake, Tom. Miss Clue, the legend that you are, a boat arrives at the dock. Henry Gale gets off. He's their leader. In the Swan Station, the beeping starts and thus begins an extremely stressful four minutes. Desmond is trying to explain to Locke that the button is real. He crashed Flight 815 when he didn't press the button on September 22nd. Locke, however, is adamant that this is all not real after what he saw in the Pearl Station. And to stop Desmond from entering the numbers, he breaks the fucking computer. This guy is like top 10 most insane units to ever walk the earth. Three minutes, 10 remaining. Desmond's like, you just killed us all. And Locke's like, no. I just saved us all. Bitch, be for real. Desmond grabs his copy of Our Mutual Friend. The end is nigh, question mark? Flashback. Desmond's holding a gun, contemplating boom boom pow. He opens Our Mutual Friend to make it the last thing he reads before he dies, and an envelope slips out. It's a letter from Penny. She hid it in the book because she knew he'd only find it if he was extremely desperate. She wrote in this letter, please don't give up. I will wait for you always. Desmond has a breakdown in the Swan Station, and then he hears this faint banging noise and what sounds like someone saying, this was supposed to work. Wait, that sounds familiar. He checks the hatch shaft and can hear John yelling, so he turns the light on, which is the hatch light that John saw after Boone died. You're kidding. Flashback Desmond's like, oh my God, there's another person on this fucking island. Celebrate good times. John saved Desmond's life. Back to present day. Desmond grabs the key that he'd stashed in our mutual friend. Oomph. <laughs> Wait, the book's called Oomph. Oh my god, Desmond stashed a key in Oomph. That's giving Saul. 30 seconds left. The hieroglyphs start spinning. I'm sorry for whatever happened that made you stop believing, but it's all real. The last hieroglyph appears. The electromagnetic whirring starts and the voice says, System failure. All the metal starts flying to the magnetic core. Charlie tries to save Echo, but Echo pushes Charlie so Charlie can escape. Echo stumbles into the computer room and has a stare down with John while everything's collapsing. <laughs> Fierce! Oh my god, golden globes for everyone. Desmond crawls to the fail safe, puts the key in, and turns it. All across the island, there's a blinding white light and a mechanical whirring. At the dock, at the camp, everywhere. At the beach camp, a piece of shrapnel falls from the sky. It's the hatch door that says quarantine. Okay, so it's giving very much explosion. Charlie walks out of the jungle unharmed. Claire's like, yes, that's my man. That's my man, let me kiss him. But where are Locke and Echo? Or Desmond? At the dock, they're all like, that was weird. Anyway, Henry holds up his end of the deal that Miss Clue made with Michael. He's not happy about it, but he says that they got more than what they bargained for when Walt joined us, so it's probably for the best. He gives Michael a boat and tells him to follow the compass bearing 325 specifically to find rescue. Michael's like, oh, and what if I tell everyone about the island? Henry says, do it, Flop. 
You'll never be able to find the island again once you leave. Okay. Whatever that means. Michael and Walt reunite on the boat and they drive off. Drive? That, is that the right word? <laughs> the others untie Hurley and tell him to go back to camp and tell everyone they can never come here or go after the others. Jack, Kate and Sawyer, however, they're not going home. They're going somewhere else. The end of this finale is so mid-2000s cliffhanger excellence. We cut to some sort of wintry scene, very not island vibes. Snow-covered mountains, howling winds, it's giving Antarctic research station. There's two guys playing chess. One of them looks over at his computer and it says 741880 electromagnetic anomaly detected. That number is 4 times 8 times 15 times 16 times 23 times 42, by the way. They rush over to the computer. One of them says, did we miss it again? And the other one says, just make the call. He picks up a phone. On the other end, from from a bedside table with a picture of Penny and Desmond on it, Penny Widmore picks up. Miss Widmore, I think we found it. 